This lecture is entitled LSD and the Art of Conscious Living. And um, tonight I am acting the role of Richard Alpert. Um, I'm so used to starting uh, these meetings that I've been holding on the West Coast um, with a legal disclaimer that rather than break a very adaptive habit, uh, let me start by saying that nothing I will say tonight should in any way be interpreted as my advocating the overthrow of the United States government by force or violence. <clears throat> A few weeks ago, there was an article uh, in Life magazine called uh, Guru Goes to Kansas. And I hope many of you saw it. It was an article that demonstrated that life actually can be beautiful. Uh, it concerned um, Allen Ginsberg. And um, I would like to put in my bit here, as every other speaker, as many of the other speakers have, uh, as a member of the uh, advisory committee. Yes, sir. As a member of the advisory committee, uh, I was um, a little concerned that none of us were consulted about dropping Alan from the program. And I think that there is a certain humor in the fact that the University of California didn't consider him a sufficient expert to participate in this conference. And during these few days, he has been, as I understand it, in Washington testifying before the Dodd Committee as an expert in the matter of psychedelics. Now, I'm proud to be at a university that sets itself above the United States Senate. <laughs> Talk louder, please. How about that? Okay. I originally had planned to uh, speak about the, the um, place of transcendental experiences, or that is the transcending of the ego in current science. And I had planned to uh, discuss adaptations that were necessary. And I was going to talk about reality and uh, some of the major quests of man. And then Friday night, I was at the bookstore, and I bought a book, which when I read it, I found it had said everything I wanted to say. So rather than make believe I haven't read it, I decided to change my speech and merely recommend to you that you all read the book because it comes from Abraham Maslow, and better it should come from him than me. The book is called Religions, Values, and Peak Experience. It's a lecture, the Kappa Delta Pi lecture series, and it's Ohio University Press, and I strongly urge that you all read this book. Religions, Values, and Peak Experiences. And he poses um, in there a series of questions, which are the basic questions, which you can divide into any number you want, but he characterized them very well. And they seem to be the questions to which the psychedelic experience and the way in which it changes your life are directed. And I thought I might just uh, review briefly by reading to you Abe Maslow's list. He says, you can consider these spiritual, philosophical, religious, humanistic, or ethical questions. What is the good life? What is the good man? The good woman? What is the good society and what is my relation to it? What are my obligations to society? What is best for my children? 
what is justice, truth, virtue? What is my relation to nature, to death, to aging, to pain, to illness? How can I live a zestful, enjoyable, meaningful life? What is my responsibility to my brothers? Who are my brothers? What shall I be loyal to? What must I be ready to die for? Now, uh, tonight, um, I am primarily concerned with uh, social institutions that we can conceive of that will help us realize some of the effects of psychedelic experiences. Now, I am not completely out of contact with reality, and I am therefore still aware of the legal and political hysteria which is surrounding the psychedelic issue. The ill-advised and irresponsible action of the California legislature, going against the advice of their own research staff and the guidelines laid down by the federal government, the present training course of the FDA in which guns are being issued to the agents to deal with us, Goddard, head of the Food and Drug Administration, Dr. Goddard yesterday in the newspaper calling consciousness expansion as a product of psychedelics, quote, sheer bunk, unquote. Now, I might get quite concerned about all of this, but the other day I was with a friend of mine who used to be a pusher. Now, um, he only sold psychedelics at very low prices, and it was very good quality, and he sold it to people he loved because he thought that was a humanly beautiful thing to do. And then when things got a little hot, he decided to go out of business. And I was asking him whether or not this was a hardship on him to go out of business. And he said, no, it was fascinating because he realized that as most of the people like him would stop selling chemicals, the mafia would move in. And he knew that sooner or later they would test the product. And what fascinated him, as it fascinates me, Now, in discussing these uh, social institutions, um, the issue that um, this situation in the government is raising uh, concerns the interface, the interface between any kind of institution you could set up and the society in which that institution must function. And in the past few years, I've been identified with some institutions for which there has been some tension in the interface, in Mexico, in Millbrook, uh, and then I have spent time with Ken Kesey and the Hells Angels, and all of these are involved in social institutions which, with which there is some tension between the institution and the larger society. Now, um, what is being created by present legislation is merely intensifying, as far as I can see, the tension that exists within this interface. And um, I have suggested, along with colleagues, some alternatives to the government's present position. Uh, one of them, which a number of us have been suggesting, is that the government use the uh, limited licensing, which it uses for radioisotopes, to set up centers which can be privately financed, government-controlled, 
where any responsible citizen could come and have a psychedelic experience for whatever reason he might choose. This would be allowing maximum freedom and yet some control and protection. <clears throat> it is now clear to me that well over 70% of the people who use psychedelics are not the least bit interested in being criminals. They are not feeling rebellious towards society. And they would welcome any reasonable alternative to the one that is currently being proposed, which is control out of existence for most of all of us. <clears throat> in a uh, book that is coming out the day after tomorrow in which I collaboratively non-collaborated with Sidney Cohen, um, I suggested in there that uh, I wrote an open letter to uh, the head of the uh, Health, Education, and Welfare, Secretary Gardner, in which I suggested that they set up an agency similar to the FAA, the Federal Aviation Agency, and uh, <clears throat> that they call the agency the Internal Flight Agency, or IF Agency. <laughs> and that the agency licensed people over 16 years of age uh, who could successfully demonstrate that they could indeed take off and land safely. <clears throat> and the pilot's license you would get would allow you only to fly with other licensed pilots. It would be much later that you would get a solo license. And that in addition, the IF agency would provide uh, ground control centers that you could call into if you needed help, if you got lost in the clouds. And furthermore, it would provide maps and charts for special journeys you might like to take. Now, <clears throat> when you think about it, there are a lot of planes sitting out at the airport, and we don't all go out and jump into them and fly away just for fun. We're all perfectly willing to go out and get licensed when we want to fly. And it isn't as unrealistic as it may sound at first <laughs> glance. <laughs> The um, Los Angeles CBS just called and they said, did we hear in your news conference that you said there should be an agency like the Federal Aviation Agency? So I gave him a statement and at the end he says, well, if that's what you want to say. There's nothing much to lose anymore, you know. <laughs> <laughs> well, um, now we can say, all right, um, what, uh, taking the society as it presently exists, what kind of social institutions do and don't and could exist that we would be interested in? Now, let me give you an example of one I tried to develop that didn't work. It couldn't exist, apparently. <clears throat> a while back here in Los Angeles, down in Los Angeles, there was a, um, a Dr. Gary Fisher who was working in the back ward of a hospital with autistic children. Not artistic children, autistic children. These are children who, at the earliest stages of their development, somehow have failed to relate to the outside world. So the result is that nothing that comes in from the outside alters their thought process. So they don't learn anything. They're turned off to the outside world, if you will, by a very early learning experience. There's nothing organically wrong with them. Now, uh, <clears throat> Dr. Fisher invited us to sit in on one of his sessions, and we came in near the end of it. This was a session in a back room, in a room in the hospital. It had been fixed up. It had drapes and carpets. Tchaikovsky was playing on the record player. There was a, a medical uh, student who was a sitter during the day, and he was holding the child. And this was a nine-year-old child who had been administered LSD earlier in the day. Now, I've worked as a child psychologist for a number of years, and I've seen many autistic children. And you could go right onto the back ward there and see them. And you could see the way in which they related to the environment. This child under LSD in this setting 
had a look of complete and open wonder in his eyes. And if I ever I had seen anybody turned on to the world, it was that child. Now, the unfortunate situation there was that at the end of the session, the child was sent back into the ward. And those of you that have had psychedelic sessions can imagine what that all must be like. Now, the reason I bring this up, there is uh, some research going on in New York with autistic children, but in this case, they give them LSD as if they were giving them uh, penicillin. There is no attempt to deal with a psychological setting for the child. Now, the reason this interests me is because of a theory we've been playing with for a long time that concerns primarily animal research. And for many of you that have heard this, this is just a quick review. It concerns imprinting. In animal research, there are stages in development during which an animal seems to be very open to certain kinds of stimuli out in the environment. And if these stimuli occur, he makes a built-in response. If during these critical periods, they're called, as they're called, the stimulus doesn't occur in the environment, he never makes the appropriate response. For example, with sheep, if you separate lamb from the flock during a critical period, then when that period is passed, if you bring the sheep in with the rest of the sheep, he will hang out alone rather than with the other sheep and sheep hang out together. So he becomes a unique uh, sheep in the group. Uh, this is an example of failure, if you will, to imprint the group during a critical period of his development. Well, now, if you <clears throat> apply this metaphor, and consider it only a metaphor, to human development, you could argue that at different stages in our development, different months, there are different critical periods during which time we are open to different kinds of experiences. This fits in, by the way, with the Freudian model of psychosexual stages of development and so on. Now, the reason further that I'm interested in this is because I'd noticed that even though all of us have had hundreds of sessions together, and uh, each of us have even had many hundred, I could still recognize all the people in the group. Certainly, many of our characteristics were different, but Tim was still Tim, and Carol was still Carol, and Jane was Jane, and so on. And I was curious what the depths of the LSD experience were all about. And it seemed to me that what had happened was that we could deal very easily with the superficial personality characteristics and behaviors and the philosophical insights, but some of the core personality characteristics didn't seem to be open to our investigation, and I felt it was primarily because we didn't know how to program sessions to explore those areas. Then I realized why we don't know much about core personality is because everybody has one. It's like a Ford assembly line. All the Fords come out, so you never even know how it works because they all look the same. But autistic children are the one group where it goes wrong right at the beginning. And it stood to reason that if we could take these autistic children and indeed explore with them through LSD, we might indeed learn something about this initial laying down of core personality concepts. Well, I wanted to correct for Gary Fisher's problem, and so I designed a study which would be run out at a country estate with doctors and so on, and we would have two rooms so that the child would move from the room he started in through the session into a whole new setting after the session. He'd be out with uh, trees and rocks and water and so on. And I presented this in great detail through a number of medical and doctor PhD people to the state of Connecticut. And seven months went by, and I had a number of letters from the President's Commission on Mental Retardation. And finally, I got turned down. 
And the reason I got turned down was the, the inside statement. Well, fluoridation is a hot issue for us this year, and we can't risk two hot political issues in one year. Now, um, uh, you can all that know NIMH be reasonably assured that NIMH would not sponsor such a project either. So this is an example, if you will, of a type of study which cannot be done at this moment in this kind of a relaxed, loose setting because of the panic concerning LSD and the need for close uh, institutional linkage. There is another institution I mentioned briefly which can't exist, although we are, various of us are trying, and this concerns a setting up a telephone emergency call service. Now, one of us has indeed been trying to do this, but I point out to her as well as to myself when we all thought about it, that if you were to list the telephone number in Los Angeles and say, anybody that's in trouble, call this number and we'll set a, send a sitter over to be with you. This is a human service to be provided. The reaction of the government would be to tap the phone and arrest the people it would call. So here again is another social institution that we would like to set up that existing legislation does not allow a natural process to occur that would otherwise occur. Now, let me shift to a second institution which is emerging in spite of everything. In 1965, we wrote up a model that was suggested a year earlier by uh, Dr. Metzner, a model for a discotheque, for a discotheque church, for a rock and roll spiritual endeavor. In our search, this is from the brochure, in our search for collaborative psychedelic game, we have evaluated various possibilities in terms of the following criteria. Can the game be designed to, re, uh, to remain fluid? Will the game raise the ecstasy level of the participants? Will the game involve an honest and open contract with society? Will the game be legally and financially sound? We have considered a variety of models mindful of the above criteria. We have chosen this new vehicle after careful assessment. As you well know, rock and roll and other strongly rhythmical folk music in its various guises provides an expanding segment of the population its musical diet. Moreover, it is demonstrable that this same music in its electrical nature is capable of turning on large groups of people. See Time Magazine's Everybody's Turned On. And if they say it, it's... <clears throat> People of diverse ages and backgrounds find a common denominator in this music which enables them to transcend their individual realities and join in group dance and group song, long the function of music in tribal and traditional societies. Viewing this phenomenon from a spiritual viewpoint, we observe the relationship both in form and content with certain modes of religious music which have been created for the objective purpose of causing the dancer or listener to transcend himself through involvement with rhythms which are related to physiological phenomena, such as heartbeat, the electrical phenomena of the autonomic nervous system, pulse, rate, breath, etc. Now, uh, we had no sooner gotten the idea on the drawing board. We were obviously part of the zeitgeist because Ken Kesey very shortly thereafter started to appear with what were called his acid tests. Now the acid test, when you read about it in the Los Angeles Times or in some of the other papers, San Jose Mercury, <clears throat> really sounded pretty scary. Here were a group of unknowing people coming to a dance hall, and LSD was being put in the lemonade, and people were having sessions in this large group scene. 
Now, I went to some of the acid tests, and in fact, I don't think there were very many people, in fact, I don't think there were hardly any at the ones I was at, that ever ingested any chemical that they didn't expect they were going to ingest. And I would say that of all of the group religious experiences I have ever been at, when some of the group snake dances were going on in the midst of these acid tests with a very powerful primitive beat and the feelings, or what I now call in my more far out state, the vibrations, being so intense, I was awed that people in the age range of 17 to 25 could participate and collaborate in as profound an emotional experience in as humanly loving a way as they did. What they had done and what others are doing and what you'll get a chance to see in part uh, when... Uh, Geard Stern and the USCO group have their show, is the control of the total environment, the auditory and visual environment simultaneously. And when there is a group agreement to, in a sense, check one's ego at the door, the experience for many of the people, especially when it is compounded with a strobe light, for example, is a tremendously intense and powerful one. And I look at the rock and roll groups that currently exist. Now, it is a, a known fact to me, although probably not a publicly statistically known fact, but it is a, I'll make an estimate, let's not call it a fact. I will make an estimate that 85 to 90% of the current rock and roll groups use psychedelics okay? from the top on down. <clears throat> and the kind of music that has been coming out of these groups, which is very interesting because it differs from jazz where the soloist improvised and it was his game. The improvisation is intensely a group experience. Just the titles of these groups, The Grateful Dead, The Lovin' Spoonfuls, just imagine that. Love and Spoonfuls play a song, Do You Believe in Magic? Now, um, in the, the influence of the East in rock and roll music with the sitar and the rhythms, the uh, Eastern rhythms. And it certainly doesn't, one of my suggestion is, here is a social institution right under our very noses that has come in with all of the values that come out of the psychedelic experience through all of the lyrics of these songs, through the rhythms, through the group experiences that are created around them. It's existing, it's going on, and all of the kids between 17 and 25 are hearing it. And uh, the suggestions that are, they, the uh, disc jockeys have an index, like the Catholic Church, and um, Bob Dylan's record, Stoned, is on the index, uh, as is a um, one by the, um, the birds. Now, it doesn't seem likely to me that any control of that nature, but you see, there it is, uh, is going to change. Now, it's very interesting that the, um, the record, Stoned, by Bob Dylan has been ruled out, while the record, Stoned, by Ray Charles... Uh, Bob Dylan's record is called Rainy Day Woman, by the way. The Ray Charles version is allowed in because that's about alcohol. But it's still, let's go get stoned. But it's an alcohol reference rather than clearly uh, a psychedelic reference. <clears throat> if you're a, uh, a devotee of rock and roll music, <clears throat> as um, I have become, you will be fascinated to notice, for example... The uh, difference between what is the alcohol culture, which is reflected in somebody like Nancy Sinatra, and uh, <clears throat> her record, uh, Boots Are Made for Walking, and that's what they shall do. Now, when uh, after the mafia, we go that whole cycle, she will be singing the word is love. 
as I understand it. That'll probably send me to jail. <laughs> Now, um, all right, so there, whether you've noticed it or not, is a social institution that has come right in and seems to be going right along. And now it's getting all American. And as you can go to the Longshoremen's Hall and get a, an American version of this without the LSD, but with lights and colors and music, and people are experiencing something. Uh, not as much as they would with acid, of course, but something. Um, and this is cr cropping up in all of the major cities in the United States. Okay, now, even in this society the way it is now, I'd like to suggest a social institution which has not yet made its appearance, but will. There has been an article circulated that is going to be discussed by Dr. Cohen, an article by Eric Kast. This is the second in a series of research projects he has done in which LSD is administered to terminal cancer patients. Now, one of the unfortunate aspects of Dr. Kast's study is that it's administered to them as a painkiller with no other preparation than that. But it's still an interesting study and when I read it in the World Medical News in uh, a few years ago, the uh, phrase that haunted me was a quote from one of the patients in which the patient said, I know I'm dying, but look at the beauty of the universe. Right? I know I'm dying, but look at the beauty of the universe. And that uh, clicked in in my computer with the memory of a woman whom I visited in Canada, Canada when I was speaking up there. She was close to 80, and I asked her why she was interested in LSD, because she had come to my lecture. And her answer was, well, the next major thing I have to do in life is to die. And I suspect that LSD may have something to do with this. Okay. There's the second bit of data I want to feed in. The third concerns Aldous Huxley's book, Island, in which he gives an actual blueprint for a psychedelic death, in which the wife of the doctor experiences the dissociative moment, and the whole experience of dying is a positive, liberating one. Now, when you read that, you were amazed at how um, disparate it was from any known real-life experience of death you knew about in this culture, at least for me. Because almost without exception, in this culture, you are surrounded at times of death by people who deny death. Because there is a taboo about death that is much stronger than any sexual taboo you could ever imagine. So that as you're dying, people are saying, you're looking better. <clears throat> as you're taking your last breath, you'll be up and around tomorrow. No confrontation with up where, around where, just up and around. It was in 1961 uh, or two, I guess, uh, that um, uh, Tim Leary showed me the Tibetan Book of the Dead. And it was on a Saturday, and I had had a session on a Thursday night with psilocybin. And as I leafed through this book, which was 2,500 years old, I came to a passage in the section on second bardo hallucinations, which brought me up short. Because there, in very minute detail, was a description of the psychedelic experience I had had on Thursday night. And which I had described on Friday as ineffable. Okay. 
how could I have experienced something which was written 2,500 years earlier as a manual to prepare people to die and be reborn? Well, all of my thoughts had been anticipated by Tim and Ralph, who are already busy working on the adaptation of the Tibetan book as a psychedelic manual. The argument being that one could look at this book as an esoteric metaphor concerning psychological death and rebirth, the transcendence of the ego, or, if you will, the psychological death of you as you know yourself to be. Now, here is an exact relationship between the physical and the psychological that is worth noting. Now, it seems, if you put all of these things together, that it might be conceivable to set up an institution. Let's imagine it's in the mountains or by the ocean. It should be oceanic or cosmic. And this would have um, small uh, dome, little domes, houses. And a person would come there to prepare to die. I hope you're all not too frightened about this topic for me to be talking about. Now, you could have as much medical help as you wanted. Right? And furthermore, you could die in whatever religious metaphor you chose. Do you not always find a psychedelic rabbi, psychedelic priest, perhaps, psychedelic ministers? There are lots of them. But in addition, when you came into the place, you would be assigned a psychedelic guide. And the whole orientation and approach would be one of dealing with training for how to get free of the ego, which creates so much of the pain and anguish concerned with dying. Now, as an aside, it's interesting to think of who the staff would be. Because what you need are experienced people who have had many psychedelic sessions, gone in and out of their egos many times. Well, here we might go to the acid test to look for our staff. And indeed, when you think of the youth being what are called fringe members of society, because all they know how to do is to transcend their consciousness, apparently, we have now found a new social institution which employs them. <clears throat> Since I must be economically realistic, I must point out to you that everybody dies. Um, my first experience with psychedelics started me on a journey. And there have been a number of metaphors that I have used along with my colleagues to describe this journey. It seemed to be a journey that concerned increased awareness. Now, I, as a Westerner, had always thought of evolution in terms of um, Darwinian evolution, and I had thought in terms of biological evolution. And then, as a Westerner, further, when I wanted to think of another model of evolution, I could think in terms of the evolving of man's mind. And as we got smarter and smarter, we were getting higher up on some kind of evolutionary scale. But there is yet another kind of evolution, which didn't seem to dawn on me in my sleepwalking state. And that evolution seemed to be one concerning consciousness, that there apparently were some higher states of consciousness. And this first session showed me a glimpse of these higher states and started me on a journey which was quite irrevocable. In fact, it didn't leave me any choice of whether I wanted to be on this journey or not. 
because once one saw the possibility of living at any other level of consciousness, which seemed to involve increased awareness, sensitivity, love, unity, it was an interesting person that could turn away. And an Eastern mystic with whom I have been an extensive correspondence has suggested that it is this experience which is addictive. It's not the drug. And I share with him that feeling that once I have been, quote, there, and for there, so I don't sound like some, um, like too much. Let me uh, reference Frank Barron's remarks yesterday, because he certainly is straight, a psychologist. <clears throat> and uh, he listed a number of criteria for consciousness. He did it exquisitely, so I'd like to borrow his list. The first one he suggested was range of effective attention. That is the experience of simultaneously being conscious of many levels of awareness. So that I can understand that at the same time I am involved in what you will excuse my language is the game of lecturing, right? I can also, I think, stand aside and see myself involved in the game of lecturing. And I also can jump to some other levels of consciousness in which I can see relationships between us other than the social role which we are in presently involved in, that is, of lecturer and audience. And at times, I even realize that we are all slowed down light. Now, um, the second point Frank makes is the realization of depths and heights for which no words exist. And I want to read to you um, a very brief example of that. This is in a book called Black Elk Speaks. It's the life story of a holy man of the Ogallala Sioux. And it's an extraordinary book, and it describes this uh, Black Elk's first mystic visionary experience, which sounds very much like hundreds of psychedelic reports I have back in the files. This is the one he had when he was nine years old. And he said, and while I stood there, I saw more than I can tell, and I understood more than I saw. For I was seeing in a sacred manner the shapes of all things in the spirit, and the shape of all shapes, as they must live together like one being. And I saw that the sacred hoop of my people was one of many hoops that made one circle, wide as daylight and as starlight. And in the center grew one mighty flowering tree to shelter all the children of one mother and one father. And I saw that it was holy. I am sure now that I was then too young to understand it all and that I only felt it. It was the pictures I remembered and the words that went with them, for nothing I have ever seen with my eyes was so clear and bright as what my vision showed me. And no words that I have ever heard with my ears were like the words I heard. I did not have to remember these things. They have remembered themselves all these years. It was as I grew older that the meanings came clearer and clearer out of the pictures and the words. And even now I know that more was shown to me than I can tell. And I think for most of us that describes uh, a component of our own experiences. The third thing Frank mentions is sensitivity of breadth of consciousness of others. Now here I think that there is an absolutely fascinating research area concerning empathy 
and ESP. When I was running a session, guiding a session, at one point a fellow said to me, now let me explain what I was doing. I was lying there listening to music and I was being with him. Now this is in silence. So that primarily what happened was I suddenly got a picture of the inside of his head. And it looked like caves and there were waterfalls. And it was dark and mysterious and jungly. And I was in the midst of this, and suddenly he turned to me and he said, are you inside my head? Right. Now, I put that away because those are the kind of things you don't like to think about. <laughs> and about a week later, I was <clears throat> guiding a session for a political science professor at Harvard. And this time I got another visual image, and I was in a French cathedral, very stately, kind of cold. Formal. And while I was in the walking with my footsteps echoing down the halls of this cathedral, he turned to me and he said, I have the strangest feeling that you're inside my head. Huh? That's the way chance works. Um, the, um, at one point, I had a session with a fellow, uh, we took 700 micrograms in the middle of a day, sitting in two upright chairs facing one another in an empty room. He had, he had created the setting, I had not. Now, this was a little much for me, and I found myself glued against the back of the chair while uh, he danced about me, playing the horn, whispering in my ear, <clears throat> showing me beautiful jewels, putting on strange hats. And uh, finally, um, I uh, went to the floor thinking to myself, um, if there only wasn't so much light, at which point he walked over and he pulled down the shades. So I thought about that, and I feel, well, that's silly. You know, that's just chance. But, but what I need is about 10 minutes rest. I thought that, and he said, uh, oh, take 20 or 30. And then he walked over to me and he looked down at me and he laughed. Now, um, it strikes me that um, if you read the many reports of ESP experiences that are available, that most of the experiences involve, the, involve two minds that were working very much in parallel mother and child, husband and wife, two intimate friends, and that when you use an experimenter and a subject who hardly know each other at all, you often don't get much better than chance, although J.B. Ryan has worked hard to show some slight statistical gain. And it seems obvious to me that a very uh, real set of researchers can and should be done, in which one creates an opportunity for two people to get, if you will, their mind in phase with one another through the use of psychedelics. Finally, the fourth category that Frank mentions is ability to observe and yet not observe the subject-object distinction. That is, to experience the feeling we are all one at the same time as maintaining the distinctions that exist among us. Now, it is very interesting that um, the LSD experience comes at a time when Marshall McLuhan, for example, points out 
that we are in the electron, electric age, when we can extend our central nervous system through technological means to the point where the world becomes like a big village because everything is instantaneous. We know everything that's going on everywhere in the village. And But M Minster Fuller tells us that it's gotten to the point now where if we all collaborated, there could be enough for everybody. And then we have these psychedelic experiences in which we experience unity and we seek collaborative relationships. And as I experience a unity in the universe, in the world, let's say, I find it very desirable to make it all subject And I also understand that almost any learning can occur almost instantaneously if one is able to get rid of the subject-object distinction between that which one learns and that which one which is learned. And you have all had that experience of one trial learning under conditions where you were really, quote, turned on to the thing you were learning. Okay, now I'm going to stop shortly, but what I asked myself was, well, okay, if this experience is so great, how could I stay high all the time? I could put it in a little more a serious vein, say, how could I stay in a state of ecstasis? That is a fluid cognitive state. How could I be fully conscious all the time? Well, it's very tempting to figure if you just keep using enough LSD, it'll do it. So we got five of us together, and we went into a house, and we decided to stay high forever. <laughs> now, in order to do this, we had to take 400 micrograms every four hours, or 2,000 micrograms a day. And we carry this experiment out roughly in more or less formal fashion, but continuing on the dosage for three weeks. Now, it's very interesting about that experiment, first of all, that I'm here to tell about it. <laughs> and uh, just a few of the interesting uh, aspects of it. First of all, it was apparent to me that you do not stay at the highest state of consciousness for three weeks. You do not stay with the clear white light. You do not stay where all is one in a completely homogeneous field. You stay much more at what you'd call second bardo. You go way out and then you come back to some middle level, but you definitely stay with a heightened sense of awareness. And then uh, I found an interesting thing about sleep patterns because uh, you, after a while, you don't go to sleep and you don't go to sleep and then you go into neutral and you're there and yet you're completely at rest. And three weeks later when I emerged, I was just as physically healthy as when I went in, rested. Okay. And I realized, we, now we broke that experiment up, it fell apart, because we had not made realistic arrangements for dealing with the interface between that experiment and the rest of the world. Because during that experiment, during the initial stages of the experiment, it wasn't possible to carry on a set of external game commitments or external social contracts. And it would seem to me a very reasonable research to carry that such an experiment out under conditions where you provide a supportive environment to see what indeed will happen. There was change. But the interesting thing was when we stopped taking the LSD, we all came down.
Well, in the past few years, um, knowing that the government might get some controls on and also in an attempt to find other ways that would one could build into one's life, I've been involved with a macrobiotic diet at some length, with karate at some length, a student of Gurdjieff, of Mayor Baba, been involved in dance groups, have been involved in meditation and breathing exercises. Once I had had one psychedelic experience, all these other things worked. Because once you have been one time outside of yourself and you know where that place is, it's the easiest thing in the world to get back there. And then I started to understand that it was going to be the way in which we created our environment or setting that was going to determine whether we could stay fully conscious all of the time. Because obviously, LSD wasn't going to do it. As I understood LSD now, all it did was show you the possibility or remind you of the possibility. But you still had to do the things in your everyday life to make it all work. See, it's a very interesting thing that the Easterner spends 10, 12 years turning off all of his attachments, getting free of all of his commitments, going to the mountaintop, meditating, eating nettle soup, um, living through snow and sleet and rain, and finally he experiences enlightenment, maybe, if he's one in ten. One in ten after 12 years' commitment. Very poor probabilities. But once he's made it, then he can probably retain that heightened sense of integrity with the whole universe because he doesn't have any environment that's going to bring him down. He doesn't go back into a network of habits that are going to catch him back up again. The Westerner doesn't have time. He's not going to go sit in the mountaintop for 12 years in a one in ten chance, right? But there is a help for him because along come psychedelics mysteriously, just as he's about to blow himself to oblivion. And here now with DMT, we can assure a businessman that during his lunch hour, he can have a totally... <laughs> But probably at 2 p.m., he'll be just as hung up as he was at 10, with a memory, with a memory in addition, the memory of what that openness was like. So it may turn out, you see, that all the drug did was to take we cynical Westerners and give us hope. by showing us the possibility and starting us as I was started on a journey, which is irrevocable. And that the journey will end up taking just as long as it would have had we done it in the East on faith without knowing what the end point was like, but we didn't have enough faith to do it. Now, um, we have been through a series of... Um, many social community experiments trying to create an environment that would allow you to maintain full consciousness. And um, all of them have failed. And all of them have taught us a great deal. And I think the word failure is the wrong word. They've all ended. They've ended because they were completed, because we saw the fallacy or the limit of the situation or it was time to change into another institution. But out of it all, I have come up with some basic rules, I feel, that are reasonable for entering into a community game designed to 
provide an environment for you to have maximum consciousness. The first thing involves the numbers. While I think that the acid tests are great for a fleeting moment for many people, large groups are provide many nooks and crannies for egos to hide in. At the other end of that continuum, the number one is a very risky number to work with because it appears very easy for you to get caught in your own defenses and be unable, if you will, to up-level them or see through them or get beyond them. Uh, Gurdjieff, the Russian philosopher, uh, puts it very well. He says, you don't realize your predicament. You're all in prison. Prisons of your mind, of your learned mind. Were you to escape, the first thing you must realize is that you're in prison. After all, if you think you're free, you can't escape from prison. Second thing is you can't escape alone. You need the help of others. And then finally he points out that you need maps and guides because after all, you've been in prison ever since you can remember. You don't even know which way is out. Okay. So that if we say, well, one isn't quite enough, we try two. Two, which is the marriage unit that exists in our present society, which seems to be having a hard, hard sledding. Problem of two is that people get locked in power struggles. And there's nobody to arbitrate. And sometimes when those struggles get powerful enough, they can ride right through LSD sessions. Well, maybe the number three. But that's a very sexually risky number. So maybe four is the best unit to work with at first. Take two couples. Because a couple is really the basic unit. Now, if I can understand why most of our experiments have ended, it's because we haven't had the courage, if you will, or the knowledge or the wisdom to set up contracts for the communities in advance of a specific enough nature. It's too easy to get a group of groovy people and say, well, what do you say? Let's all live together and it'll be great and we'll all have sessions and we'll go places. Or just to open the door and in come ten people and you close the door and there's your group. <laughs> so there is some kind of contract uh, because these kinds of groups often end up in somebody saying, well, look, that isn't what I'm here for. Right? So it's better to set it out in front. So in front, it is agreed that we are a group on a journey together. And that this journey, the goal of this journey, is to increase each of our awarenesses. And that we have decided to travel as a group. Now, if you want to travel as an individual, do so, but don't join a group. Right? This is a very specific type of group I'm talking about now, but it works, as far as I understand thus far. Make the definition of the goals as explicit as possible. It has got to be built into the contract that the person understands that the risk is his own identity as he knows himself. This leaves not open to him what is known as the cop-out of saying, oh, well, after all, that's me. That's the way I am. Okay? That's not available. The next thing is that for the first period of time after the group is formed, it can do little other than primarily deal with its own unfolding. And every participant must be ready for a total confrontation at all times. That is, there is no place to hide. Can't get up cranky in the morning and say, leave me alone, I'm cranky. 
can't go into the bathroom and close the door and say, well, I'll be in here and I'll think hateful thoughts while they're not around. It is a constant 24-hour commitment to being with the other members of this group. And the contract reads, I define, to the extent that I am capable, my basic reference group as the group rather than myself, the individual. Now, if you're not ready to enter into that group, then try another method. Now, the next point is that the contract must demand complete honesty at all times and trust to the extent that you are able. Now, honesty and trust mean something different than to people that have been in psychedelic experiences or have been in frightening experiences with others than it does to other people. Very often, you're going to have a session with somebody and you say, well, now, it's important that you trust me. And that you be honest with me. The person says, oh, I'm honest, I'm honest. I trust you, I trust you. <laughs> and you start the session. And suddenly the person looks at you and you know from the look in his face that smoke is coming out of your nose. <laughs> your ears have gotten points on them. You're breathing fire. And you say, I bet I look pretty awful, <laughs> which is an understatement. And he's quivering. <laughs> because the level at which he said, I trust, wasn't nearly the depth of the level of trust that was demanded. Because suddenly he's thinking, what am I doing in this room with this idiot who's given me this drug? Am I out of my mind? Which he is, of course. <laughs> And very often people have returned from psychedelic sessions. Well, the one thing I certainly learned was how much I didn't trust anybody. And that's why it was so hellish. I was asked recently, why do you, how do you account for bad sessions? And I, my answer was dishonesty. Because I am convinced that a person knows inside of himself just what's going on. And that I have very often gotten into a situation where gone through complicated arrangements to arrange a session, the person's there, and tremendous cost and effort, but I know I'm not ready. And I have to have the guts to say I'm not ready. And being this honest, you can get confident that your sessions are positive and meaningful. Now, one of the keys that isn't in the contract, but it's a key to the community, is to keep everybody subject don't get into any of the hymns and hers. It's not me and them, it's us. And when you experience a negative feeling towards somebody else, keep in mind that you have made them object to the extent that you put that feeling in. Next, the community should go as fast as the fastest person, not as fast as the slowest person. Because the person that's made the most progress can bring anybody else there very quickly. The group should always move in relation to the person that is most aware at any moment. Briefly, as far as environment is concerned, cut down on external stimuli. Desirable to get away from a high energy center, a city. Get away from all of the complex social vibrations that exist in present uh, cities if you have an option. No TV. Cut down on newspapers to once a week if you... That's enough news. It'll all be there. <clears throat> Put some control on your telephone. The telephone, as far as I understand it, is like dial a mind. Anytime you want to call somebody else's mind, you dial them, and when it rings, you're supposed to be available. Well, you've got to turn off a lot of the external stimuli for a while until the group starts to function as a unit. Turn on beauty in the environment, and this is what the women are great at, creating ecstasy in the environment with art, with flowers, with beautiful things that wake you up. Anything that's an alarm clock to wake you up to a higher level of consciousness. 
meditative moments and a meditative place in the house, whether it's a meditation room or a separate meditation house, or in Mexico we had a meditation tower, or whether it's a nook in a wall that you go and look into, some place that isn't involved with the economics and the external games that the group is involved in. And as far, finally, as the role of sessions in all of this, <clears throat> I now understand uh, the experiment we went through this winter. We got to the point where it was happening so fast for the four of us that we didn't have time to take LSD. All right? In other words, we all knew what the possibility was. We had all seen each other as all human beings. We had all experienced the unitive moment with one another. Now we realized and we could see when it wasn't being realized where the flaw was. There was sufficient consciousness for us to do something systematically to get ourselves to this other state of consciousness. So it may well be interesting that the um, moratorium that Tim Leary called for for a year, which he said was a cooling off period, <clears throat> while I uh, don't share that, uh, I mean, I'm not making that call by any means or even suggesting it, I do say that those of you that have had psychedelic experiences Many of you have come back from these experiences mildly depressed. And this depression upon close analysis is because you look and you see that you were involved in some very ugly human games. Social contracts with your marriage partner, in your job, a dishonesty here, a little deception there. A, a, a dead subject-object relationship. If you're a teacher, you're going in and looking at the students as them. Right? There's some point in your life that you see, and it's not how it could be. Now, I understand that the LSD experience, just taken once, starts this whole process. And what fascinates me is even the people who have taken LSD and have been backing out of the room from almost the moment they took it, very nice session, very nice. Thank you very much. <laughs> Even these people, a year or two later, you know the funniest thing, right? Now, I can't... Uh, I can't really uh, predict all of the things that will happen as far as the psychedelic world is concerned next. It does seem to me that for many, many thousands of people, a journey has been begun just like my journey. And if it is true that evolution involves increased consciousness, and if indeed I have labeled the journey correctly, perhaps the groundwork has already been laid down, and now all we need to do is listen to ourselves. I'm going to stop now and take questions. May I ask two questions? Well, I ask one question. One, one question. question. Okay. Now, you've seen this, uh, Baba's views on drugs. Yes, I have. <laughs> That's not my one question. <laughs> right. Okay. <laughs> Thank uh, you so much. <laughs> <laughs> Go ahead. Uh, this is a setup. I mean, well, I know I'm walking into this one, so I'm, I'm ready for it. I'm sorry. She's uh, ready for it, too. Okay. I'll try to talk later. Uh, on February... Um, no, you're going to ask a question now. We're not well, going to make a point. I'm going to build up to it because this is one thing you haven't said, and I think it'd be interesting to the audience to know this fact. On February uh, 4th, I believe it was, you said in Berkeley that you no longer anticipated using LSD in the foreseeable future. 
Uh, now, if the paper is right, the Daily Californian, February 7th, uh, I wonder, uh, and you also said that you wanted to know what a man could, uh, if a man could be a man, what a man could be without the drug. And you thought that the, um, see, it says the only way to achieve a perpetual state in which a man can be a man is through non uh, non chemical means, he said. I didn't say that. Okay, it's an issue. Oh, that's from me? Is, okay, then is, I said it right. From the, uh, Check. Oh, okay. Right. Now, you oh. have, uh, <laughs> you have uh, postulated that the uh, psychedelic guru, uh, can be, um, a safe, guarantee of a good trip, of a spiritually enlightening trip, uh, and I would ask you, uh, in view of Bob's statement that only a person on the fifth plane, uh, and we most of us are not even on the plane, let alone standing in any relation to the inner planes of consciousness, uh, only a person on the fifth plane can safely, without harm to himself or harm to the person that he is uh, supposedly helping, uh, do any good whatsoever uh, in would a you, spiritual excuse way. Me, would you ask your question, please? So we I want to know what you think of this statement. Okay. Do you think you, you are helping people uh, when you are being a uh, psychedelic guru? Do you think that you are not harming your One own question. spiritual Thank you. progress? Thank you, Paula. <laughs> uh, I'd like to tell you a brief story. Uh, one of the things one does as one uh, works with psychedelic chemicals is one continually looks for maps and charts to help you understand more of what you're experiencing. Now, in the course of our searchers, searches, a number of us independently have come across the works of an Eastern mystic by the name of Mayor Baba. And I found when I read his works called Listen Humanity, God Speaks, so on, which are available from Sufism Reoriented on Sutter Street, I found that these were most in tune with my own psychedelic experiences. That his descriptions of other levels of consciousness fit in almost identically with my, my own experiences. And that he also apparently was referring to a lot of things which uh, were experiences I had not shared. And so I used his books as a manual in sessions. And then, um, uh, from an old graduate assistant of mine, I got a message that Maya Baba had met a young fellow in India who had said to him, uh, you've got to stop taking drugs. And I said what most people say under these circumstances. Well, he told that young fellow. He didn't tell me. Then came the second message from India, which was telling the young fellow to tell everybody. So I was quite bothered by this, so I wrote this man a letter. Now, uh, not meaning to say anything inappropriate, this man is an avatar who says, in effect, I am uh, God in human form, and it's very difficult to write a letter to such a person. <laughs> but I wrote as honest a letter as I could, and I explained him what I was doing and how I was using the psychedelic. And he wrote back, or his secretary wrote back, one of the most sophisticated letters concerning drugs I had ever received. In which he said, in effect, the experiences you're having are illusory. They are no more like true transcendence than a mirage is like water. Water. 
Then, he said, to a few serious spiritual seekers like yourself, LSD may have started you on something, but it can do you no more good. And what you must do now is follow me. Love me enough and I will take you through because you need a perfect master to get to the seventh plane. Then he said, you may take LSD three more times and then you must stop forever. Well, between the time I'd sent the letter and the time I received the answer, I had taken it once. So that left me either two or three, depending on how you counted. And I started to wrestle with this problem. After all, I'm supposedly sort of in the LSD business in one way or another. I mean, I'm not pushing it, but I certainly am talking about it and thinking about it and built systems about it. And um, so I didn't answer his letter, and I got a wire, did you receive my letter? And I sent a wire back that I received his letter. And I continued to... Uh, wrestle in my own mind with this issue. Now, uh, in the past week, I have been, um, I have received, uh, I think, three special delivery communications strongly urging me to be wise enough at this conference to present Baba's views and to espouse them. Now, it's very easy to take a reasonably uh, easy way out and say, in effect, well, this guy probably never had LSD. Now, how does he really know? Okay. Except that the letters are very sophisticated. He says, look, I understand the difference between the psychedelics and the opiates. You know? right? I mean, he's not. And he says, what you get uh, addicted to is the experience, not the drug. But you keep depending on it. And then um, he instructed a number of his followers in the East and West to set out on a pilgrimage to stop the use of drugs in the United States. Now, up until this point, all of the writings I have ever read of my Mayor Baba said, in effect, don't worry, be happy. Take it easy. It's all happening. Okay. Love is the way. And now suddenly are coming special delivery directives about not doing things, about derangement. Now, my policy under these situations is to look within myself. And I have been doing that as intensively as I know how. I have indeed, Paula, not taken LSD since February 14th. And it just doesn't feel right to me, what he says. And it is not in line with my own experiences. And I am not a person of blind faith. And therefore, in being honest to my own experiences, illusory though they may turn out to be, I must take the position I am taking because psychedelics indeed took me from being a very limited very somewhat mechanical Western man and opened my eyes enough so that I could even read Maya Baba without scoffing at him. Best evidence is and the flaw in his letter was saying, a few yes. souls like you. Well, who Amen. else? People you trust? Questions, please. You will not be the Dr. Albert, uh, would you please make a comment about Solco and uh, where people may get the information from this organization? 
Uh, SOLCO is a non-geographical insemination dissemination organization, which has its um, sole existence in Box 309 at Menlo Park. Wood. And if you uh, advise them of your address, a lengthy bibliography on consciousness expansion comes your way, along with all of the other things that interest us. <laughs> along with pictures of Shiva Shaktis and mandalas and stuff like that. It's a, um, I realize that all we could hope for is a social institution at this point. You see, I went to Los Angeles and gave some lectures, and there were like a, a thousand people there. And then I sent out a questionnaire, said, if you want to fill it out, send it in. And hundreds of these questionnaires came back of people saying, let's all collaborate in setting up something humanly beautiful to do. At first. And I looked and I looked and I looked and I realized that we, the heterogeneity of all of us, because many of us never took psychedelics, but arrived at the states of consciousness through many other means, that there wasn't any single game we could work at together at the moment. The best thing we could do was set up some kind of a nervous system, which is a mailing list, if you will. And so I just started to offer Box 309 and have been every month or two months sending out a mailing as fast as I could afford it. And there are now 8,000 people who try on the West Coast who are yeah. us, whoever we are. And they are, it's a constant stream of the most beautiful letters uh, from a tremendously wide range of people with diverse interests. That's what Sulco is. Box 309 Menlo Park. And I... Do you have any comments about turning on without yeah. drugs? I've only turned on once without, but several times with, and... Uh, it wasn't a dream, but it began in a dream state no, at the very end of the morning sleep. And I haven't been able to replicate that sort of experience I since. Don't... And I'm wondering whether you know anybody that has or no. what steps have been made in this direction. Well, uh, become... the question concerns turning on without drugs. Uh, Abe Maslow's book, I'm, whether you're familiar with it or not, or his work, he is concerned with peak experiences. And he points out that most people have had these experiences at one time or another spontaneously, but weren't able to label them, all right? And um, uh, as you read through his accounts, you find a number of settings that are indeed settings that seem to precipitate these. Now, if you argue that what you mean by turn on is a chemical alteration of the brain, that there is clear evidence that the mystic visionaries and the psychedelic visionaries and the diet visionaries and so on were having some common core spiritual experience. So there was some common chemical alteration occurring to all of them. Then you notice that this chemical alteration can be brought about either from the body through the endocrine system or from the cerebral cortex downward, if you will. Then you see that by using, for example, a mantra, repeating some phrase, for example, just one of the little things in uh, Paul Rep's Zen Flesh and Bones in the back of it, like uh, uh, just sit down and get into a very comfortable position, candle, very quiet, and or outside, and say, uh, uh, let me slowly turn off my senses, look within, and find my own true self, or my own calm center, or something, and just keep simplifying and simplifying. It's a repeated mantra that will take you there, Will. Now, there are also any number of external environmental things like mandalas or you know, various settings or scenes that will do it. You working from your body, it is possible clearly through diet. It's clearly possible through a number of kinds of physical yoga, breathing, for example. But what I was pointing out in that community concern is that there have been times when I've been living in a community, when I can come home to this place, hung up, caught, busy being Dick Alpert, angry at power, you know, all my games, walk in and I become high when I walk in the door. Right? And uh, I used to measure houses and say, well, that's about a 75 microgram house. <laughs> Would you compare and contrast subjectively psilocybin and LSD? Contrast psilocybin and LSD. Subjectively. Subjectively. Well, that's a little hard for me to do accurately because I, uh, all my psilocybin experiences were 
predominantly before my LSD experiences, and um, I haven't had a psilocybin available to me for a long time. Um, the best I can say at the moment is that, um, and furthermore, uh, it has... <laughs> okay, all right. <laughs> okay. Uh, when we were taking psilocybin, we were using dosages anywhere from 2 to 20 uh, milligrams and 26 milligrams, something like that. Now, as I understand it, a comparable dose to 200 micrograms of LSD might be anywhere above 60 uh, microgram, uh, milligrams instead of the smaller dosage. So that I don't know that I have comparable data. The, uh, the experience I had with psilocybin, almost all the experiences were of the... Um, if you define a ladder of experiences, let me give you a quick ladder and then I can show you where it is on the ladder. Uh, the most probable experience people report is heightened sensitivity, color, uh, kinesthesis, uh, sound, and so on. Uh, and that's a very easy thing to experience. And external hallucinations, the walls creeping and crawling and so on. Then the next level of experience is when it's a social situation, is uh, feeling that uh, seeing the other person uh, with figure ground reverse, that is, the ways in which we are different becomes background, and the ways in which we are same becomes figure. And that's quite different from the way most of us live every day, where the way in which we're the same is background, and we the figure stands out as individual differences, especially among Westerners. Now, under that condition, there is still a you and a me. It's just that we see that you and me are made of the same thing, all right? And we say, wow, you and I are one, but we're still, I still see you as you and I as I. Now, it's the next level after that where all that starts to disintegrate, where your body starts to fall apart, and it all starts to turn into energy, for example, or other levels where it becomes unity in the perceptual sense as well, and the you-ness disappears. Now, as far as I know, most of my psilocybin, or I say most of my psilocybin experiences, we're at the level where one experienced that social unity, tremendous closeness to other people, tremendous, we used to call it the love drug, because it just made people so close and at one and just human love heaps in the most beautiful sense of the word. All right? And that was uh, psilocybin. Then along came LSD and just blew our minds, you know. It was, uh, <clears throat> it was a whole other level because it, the LSD then became a very... Uh, it was, it was not social. It was not a social drug. It was too profound. It just took you way beyond that. It was all molecules or all energy. And many people have had a great deal of difficulty trying to use LSD as a social drug. Let's take a little LSD and have a groovy evening. Well, now, if you're going to do that, don't do it because it's illegal. But if, <laughs> hypothetically... <laughs> If you're planning, uh, I don't know how to say it legally. Um, I have heard that people who have had them. Uh, well, I'll give you an example. For example, I've gone to the ballet with LSD. And I can strongly urge people to take it a number of hours before they're going to do anything. And don't try to do any external social game till maybe the fourth or fifth hour, because you may be just a little too much out of contact. Now, the ballet is very interesting. Um, first time I sat in the orchestra watching Nureyev, and it was quite an experience because Nureyev definitely transcends uh, being Nureyev, just becomes the essence of form, and it's an exquisite experience. And he was like uh, just uh, going through space, free space. Uh, the next time I did this, I sat in the balcony, and Nuryev wasn't dancing. And the whole thing looked like a species that was trying to fly but hadn't quite made it off the ground yet. And I <laughs> spent the whole evening with this great sadness because I was caught in the evolutionary significance of the ballet. Sir. Yeah, I want well, first to thank you for directing your attention to the things that I've been thinking about and giving me some very good answers. And I'd like to ask if you could share with us something more specific of the answer you have about how easy it is to go from knowing where you want to go 
to finding these other paths such as diet, meditation, and so on. You've said it's easy, and you've given some general indications. I think it'd be something very worthwhile for you to give us just one specific example, perhaps, of how you've done it and how it felt. Well, it's really what it is, as I understand it, is selective perception. That if you don't know what you're looking for, it's very hard to find it. And at the minute you know what you're looking for, it's practically everywhere you look. And that there practically is nothing in the environment that you can't use as an alarm clock or as some technique to increase your awareness. For example, <clears throat> you're driving down the street, and um, Gurdjieff has a great exercise. <clears throat> driving down the street, pick a truck or a sign up a couple of hundred yards ahead and say, see if I can remain completely conscious of my hands on the steering wheel between here and the sign. And you'll be amazed at how difficult that is to do. How quickly you go to sleep and you just wake up and suddenly remember you had even undertaken that task. And you can do a whole set of little... Uh, and Gurdjieff has perhaps one of the most sophisticated Western methods suitable for Westerners for waking up, which is a systematic technique for observing yourself. Now, it's very interesting, and I'll be very straight about this. When I went to visit the Gurdjieff groups in New York, I found a lot of people who disappointed me. And then I noticed that a lot of um, psychedelic people came into the group and that the man that was running the group found them very responsive to what he was talking about. Right? And um, I then understood that, again, as I said before, once you know where that point is, then any method is one that you can make use of. And that the people that had had psychedelics could make fantastically rapid use of the Gurdjieff method, uh, much more rapidly than the very systematic students who had been working at it, but did not have an anticipation of what the end state was like. But if just once you and I have been one, how can we ever really go back into being defensive with, from one another without somewhere knowing? You know, somewhere knowing? And it's really interesting because the whole life becomes very much like a tennis match in which you are playing the game very hard and enjoying the exquisiteness of the game. And at the same time, you can look across the net at your opponent and smile at the beauty of the day. And it's that multiple level, and then it becomes N levels. It's like baklava. You know, it's so many levels you can't even count. Yes. I'd like to uh, ask a question that it's the reverse of everything that I've been reading and hearing. I, w I would like to know if there's been anything done on the opposite side of the coin, that what happens when a person takes uh, has a psychedelic experience, an aesthetic, sensitive, kind, loving person is going through a psychedelic experience in a squalid, dirty, unpleasant, raucous surroundings. Have there been any such experiments, and how have they resulted? <laughs> Many more than any of us can imagine. Could you tell me what it what happens? Well, it seems to be true. Um, Tim pointed this out a long time ago that um, at first it appears that the uh, you seem to be very dependent on the setting, and that your set or preparation can very easily be overridden by bad setting. And then, as you get more experienced and more trusting of the process, you can ride through, if you will, bad settings uh, because of the strength of your set. And finally, if you're a truly enlightened holy man, you can move through any uh, setting without ever, uh, if you will, losing this consciousness. And if you consider for a moment, you realize that the drugs are a setting because they are an external thing that is part of that environment or your body, which is a setting for your consciousness also. And you can understand that finally the point is of being fully conscious without any of these uh, external, if you will, uh, dependency of some sort. Now, um, there are a number of reports of people who have been in bad settings um, who have had uh, very bad experiences. Now, let me describe what bad is, because that's a big topic these days. See, I haven't been one of these people that's arguing for strong controls, and I'm not worried about what's happening. 
I'm sorry, I just can't join the throng. I'd like to, but I don't. And I know an awful lot of teenagers. I had a very interesting evening recently in Los Angeles. I was I met with a group of mothers and fathers and sons and daughters. Sons and daughters were all 15 and 16 years old, and they were all taking LSD. And the parents were all upset. That was the definition of the two groups. On one side were upset parents, and on the other side were teenagers drugged teenagers and the parents started out with the accusing you've done this to our children and the, the boys one of the boys said now mother <laughs> and there was one really great line in that whole meeting when one of the mothers said the thing about my son is that he's gotten so good I wish he'd be bad like an adolescent He's thoughtful, he's loving, he wants me to take LSD with him. <laughs> he brings his girlfriend to the house and it's all wonderfully, she says, this isn't what adolescence is supposed to be doing. It doesn't feel natural to me, right? Now, um, as I've been interviewing literally hundreds of teenagers who have been using LSD, because I do spend a great deal of my time, if you will, out in the field doing sociological surveys, uh, I found out that most of the sessions that uh, kids are having quite loosely, they are spending a great deal of energy struggling with, and they spend a great deal of time in very tense, high energy output because they have no calm center. But the other thing I noticed is that something happens to them over time, whether they went into it for that reason or not, that gets them starting to listen. A group starts out, for example, I talked to one 16-year-old a couple of weeks ago. He said, the first time I took acid, I was at a party in Los Angeles, and somebody was handing around these things, and they said they were LSD, and it would be a gas, and we'd all have a sexual ball, and so I took them, and it was the worst thing that ever happened to me. And I spent all the time in the bathroom on the floor crying. Now, the, first of all, the disposition of that particular case depends completely on who he comes in contact with next. The evidence is very clear. If he comes in contact with somebody who does not understand what the psychedelic experience is about, the likelihood is that that fellow will move off into a short-term psychotic episode because he will be surrounded by people who think he is crazy. And that is the setting in which he would then function. So the police and, like, I was talking to a doctor who's here who is part of a research group studying this problem, and they have intakes every night in their hospital for bad reactions. And I said, well, what do you do when the guy gets there? Well, we put him in a room. We have a nurse go and sit with him. Well, does she, has she ever had the experience? Oh, of course not. Well, now, I'll show you a simple thing like this. If you are sitting in the middle of a very wild uh, internal tangle and anybody asks you a question, like, how are you feeling? <laughs> right? Very reasonable, loving question. Come in. What nurse wouldn't ask that question? How are you feeling now? That is enough to push a person off into the wildest, wildest uh, isolating experience. And it would seem to me an obvious thing in view of the data we know on set and setting that every hospital should have a trained psychedelic person there. And when a person comes in, he is put with this individual who sits with him and who understands what's happening. The evidence is if you end up with somebody who does understand, and what I, we've been getting for years now, telephone calls all hours of the night and day, like a girl called me the other day, a few a month ago, actually. She said, um, 
I took LSD five days ago and I'm still high and I'm scared. And I keep going up and coming down. Am I insane? Right? Now, I said to her, well, you know, you're really very lucky. Because most of us after a session have to wait a long time before we can explore again. And by your being able to go in and out, you can explore our levels of consciousness and build the bridges much faster than the rest of us can. Uh, you're really, you can become a really, you can make a tremendous amount of gain in understanding your own sangsara. And call me every day and let me know. Gal was joyous. Now, what are the probabilities that she would have gotten that reaction from any hospital, any other situation she would have turned to in our society? So it is true that bad settings lead these kids to bad experiences. But this kid said an interesting thing. He said, after that experience, I knew there was something there, but I wasn't going to have it with them anymore. And what I did was I went out and I bought some acid. And I got my best friend and we went down by the ocean. This is 16 years old. And we sat on a rock and we looked out at the ocean and we took LSD. Now, is that wisdom? Is that social irresponsibility? Is it some kind of guts information? But it's this kind of business. And I guess you see what you're ready to look for. The people that come in contact with me obviously are not the people that are having these horrible nightmares that we're reading all about. The best evidence is that it's well worth working to make the setting good. And by a good setting, it really means a very safe and secure place. People you trust and love. A place where you will not be disturbed. No likelihood there's going to be a knock on the door, a telephone call. Turn it all off. Have a babysitter for the children. It's got to be a completely uh, a protected environment from the unexpected until you know better what you're doing. Out in nature, if you can provide a secure, quiet enough place, great. And then surround yourself with things that are in tune with the universe. And the fewer things you have created by men's minds, the better. <clears throat> Therefore, rocks, water, candles, dirt, wood, a fireplace, all good. And if you have Indian uh, oriental rugs or Indian prints, these, after all, are probably the hashish fantasies of somebody or other. <laughs> Questions? Yes. I think we'll stop in about two more questions. Uh, do you have any suggestions for anybody who has a higher level of consciousness than the ordinary society to live in peace in that society? Without going into space? Well, I think the question reflects that the level isn't high enough. <laughs> because as I understand it, as one increases one's consciousness, one is able to see more and more ways in which to be in tune with the world around you. Now, at first, you feel uh, somewhat separate from it. But then, after all, if the experience is indeed a unitive one, like, I'll tell you a very interesting experience. I was going east with a friend of mine who was a very advanced guy. And we got to Chicago, and we were both just from driving across the country together and being together, we were both extremely high wide open, just in this little Volkswagen, speeding across the country. We got to Chicago, and he said, well, when I leave you now, uh, everybody I meet, I'm going to try to make a real contact with. Now, this was a challenge, and this horrified me, because I was about to go to a set of technical meetings on computer programming, and I was going to then go to my parents' home. And the task looked Herculean. <laughs> and I started out, and I found myself at um, University of Illinois in an elderly mathematician's office. And he was behind his mask of being an elderly mathematician. And um, 
I looked at him, you know, with love and with openness and, you know. <laughs> we have become very good friends, I am happy to report. Uh, the thing worked for about four days until I had just worn down. <laughs> because the energy involved in... Right? But I don't find any boredom in finding things to do, nor do I find it that the world isn't totally open to being lived at the highest level I can reach at all times. And it is merely my own ability to get rid of me before I can find the place in it all. So, I think I'll stop now. The first question is, are drug-induced altered states as valid as altered states that are not drug-induced? And <laughs> what value do drug states have? Well, I obviously must start out before this discussion with a disclaimer that I do not advocate the violent overthrow of the government. <laughs> Nonviolence is a whole other matter. Uh, I do... I do think uh, laws aren't very conscious, but I uh, want to uh, say that I can't advocate the breaking of a law. You must do what you do. Um, I have found psychedelics a very uh, significant and important and useful part of my spiritual practice, more so many years ago than now. Um, although even in recent years, it has been slightly useful. Um, initially, for me, psychedelics was a was a, a really radical way of breaking through some very powerful mindsets or habits of thought, and it opened me to a deeper truth of my being. And I. I can't speculate because it's a hypothetical question that I can't deal with because I don't know. But I can see my colleagues at Harvard and who I was, we were very simpatico in my old form. And I meet them now and we have very little business together. They are living in a different world than I am. And I really feel that the root of that ship for me was... Uh, due to psychedelics. So I honor them and I would n never be a hypocrite to deny that even though there's a lot of social pressure on me often to do that. Um, however, what was necessary in 1960, one, is not necessarily necessary now because what I have noticed is that some of the breakthroughs from the kind of reality that was so absolute in when I was growing up those breakthroughs through the rock music and through a whole variety of vehicles is probably stimulated in large part by psychedelics in the United States anyway. Um, that has become, that is mainstream. Those shifts in perspective are much more available to somebody without chemicals now than they were in the time that I first ingested psilocybin that um, I talk in the Midwest, for example, and may give a lecture, and the audience, I would say that at least 70 or more percent of them have never smoked pot or taken any psychedelic, and most of them have never read any Eastern books or been to the East. And I say the same things I was saying in 1960, which a small group of people could, could hear, and I find that mainstream America, almost, not quite. I mean, still, it's a selective group that comes to hear Ram Dass, but it's in Iowa, uh, and they are all going like this, and they're hearing it, and they're hearing it because the, the zeitgeist has changed. The cultural milieu about realities has shifted, just like why 
channels and all of those things are much more accessible into the society, the possibility that there are other realms of reality is more available. I mean, it used to be that when I was in the United States, because of the overriding power of the main church of America, which was science, which was based on a physics model, a natural science model, that anything about altered states of consciousness was treated as very aberrant. And I would go to England and I would find an entirely different milieu. There they had had years and years of being able to absorb the idea of other planes of reality. And they had occultists and all that were part of the society. They were no longer. And when you look at why there are gurus in India, part of it is that the society supports that quality of cultivation of spirit in people. And it acknowledges it while we put those people in mental hospitals for the most part. Because they are aberrant from mainstream consciousness. So um, we have had some basic shifts which make psychedelics somewhat less of a necessity for breaking through than they used to be. I meet many, I work with kids now, and many of them have never had any psychedelics, and I don't find that there is a great bridge in our consciousness. They can hear what I have learned through all these experiences, and they can hear it, and they can hear it in a way that is useful for them to hear it. So I want to say that at the outset. I next want to say that um, that um, the governmental legislative structures regarding uh, chemicals is so um, insensitive to the differences between what they mass as drugs, the differences between uh, the tryptamines or psychedelics on one hand and the opiates on the other, and those are all classed as drugs, so that morphine and LSD are considered drugs, and they're considered bad because they are socially injurious to the ongoing structure of society. Now, that's a very interesting social political question of how, in a healthy society, how much it can allow for that which would change itself, and how much it punishes anything that would change it, because, and if the fear count is very high in a society, it becomes very rigid in its boundaries of rejecting anything through which it would grow itself. And it keeps stifling itself because it can't allow those pseudopods of growth to happen, especially when they're powerful, because from a society's point of view, they are chaotic. Now, what's happening in our society, I mean, let me just jump politically for a moment, is that you have an increasing economic polarization in the society, and you have lower windows of opportunity for a larger segment of the population. And there's not as much e equality of poverty as Dr. V was talking about. Everybody in the village, Dr. V said, was poor. And so everybody understood and they shared what they had. As you get these incredible differentials of uh, King of the Mountain, what you have is the opportunity, the opportunity for a way of drug use as First, an economic new, other, other power system to come in to counteract a, a structure that is not giving people opportunity. So that the, the black market drug culture has become another economic structure other than nationalism, for example. It's like multinationals now. And the other thing is it also provides the drug experience is used very heavily for escapism meaning it's used to push away what is an unpleasant set of circumstances. So when you look at what the drug problems are in the culture, you see that you're dealing with uh, basic dissatisfactions, part of which are economically motivated in inner city people who don't have a window of opportunity. I mean, if you can make 500 bucks a day selling crack, you're going to do it much more readily than you're going to go to school and work at McDonald's for three bucks an hour, three and a half bucks an hour, uh, for a future that is really kind of iffy anyway, because you're black or whatever, uh, or some minority group. So, um, and, but the interesting thing is the movement of cocaine primarily, and now some crack, but mostly cocaine into the middle class Caucasian population. And that represents a deeper dissatisfaction with the myths of the culture, that the, that the 
break of the family that Dr. V has been talking about, and a whole lot of factors of where the myth that when people make it, when they do everything the society said, if you do this, you'll be happy, and they do it, and then they're not happy, then they are open to the use of the drugs as a vehicle to escape from the fact that they played the game as well as they could, because the society is basically an externalized society. It's basically saying you will be happy if you have a speedboat, or you'll be happy if you have a second home, or you'll be happy if you have some material thing. And basically, that's a quick rush, but it's not happiness. It's pleasure, but not happiness. And what we, the society's been selling is pleasure, not happiness. And that discrepancy is part of the root cause of the, the use of drugs as escapism. Now, what the society is afraid of are two things. One is that if too many people use escapist things, first it builds another economic structure, which undercuts the whole economic structure of the society. I mean, this is all, none of it's taxable. <laughs> because of the society's naivete, again, instead of making it taxable, which they couldn't. The, set, the other part of it is that um, uh, the society is afraid that what drugs do is undermine the verticality of power structures. That when you take psychedelics, for example, or most drugs, you look at social institutions and you see that they are rather flimsy constructions of the human intellect. And, I mean, I've gone on LSD through Washington and looked at the Pentagon, and it just looked like this huge little creation of fear of a group of t teenagers. <laughs> I mean, that's roughly what it looked like. I mean, the whole, all these institutions that are made, the mint and all, they're made till the Treasury Department, made to look like you're supposed to look like this, and, you know, like, they're, they're, not, they're, not, uh, they're not pilgrimage sites in the sense of worship, although people do tours to see the power of the government. But you can feel that that power is rooted in fear. And when you see that, it undercuts that power. And why the drugs in the early 60s undercut the power of the monolithic structures and the verticality of it such that the anti-Vietnam movement could get hold, for example. That was rooted in drugs. That was rooted in psychedelic openings. That wasn't just social consciousness that was like the social consciousness of the 40s and 50s. It was a different kind of thing. It was where the power of the power holders were in jeopardy. And Nixon sat in his White House and watched that scene out there. And there was a handwriting on the wall that the power had been gone. And all the sexual freedom and women's rights and gay rights and all of the whole range of those things came out of that breakdown of the myths of the, the, the verticality of the system. So there is a fear in a society of those kinds of things, chemicals, that would alter the citizen's sense of their own power, really. And we've, so there's that one, and there's the shift of the economic base. These are all basic political social issues that are around the drug issue. It can't just be treated as good guys and bad guys, and drugs are evil, because drugs are not evil. They are just another set of experiences, and somebody who is addicted like Lee Iacocca to more power and money is as addicted and, and he has as big a drug habit. And the person who has the need for continuous sex all the time and more and more conquests all the time, and which is keeping a whole set of industries operating all the time in terms of pornography and all of that stuff, that is just as sick an addiction as cocaine. And we're gonna deal with that in the addiction group. I'm sorry, I shouldn't be cheating. Strike all that. I didn't say anything. <laughs> so, um, see, we have a little problem with the structure, you see, because over, everything overlaps. Um, so when we come to the distinction, besides all of that has been the problem of the society that leads to drugs used as withdrawal or uh, as avoidance, the other end of it is the sacramental use of chemicals, in which chemicals can be used as instruments for regaining our own divinity. And it has been used historically for, through culture after culture, for generation after generation. And we have now 
legally thrown out the baby with the bath, in a sense, because we were so afraid of the dirty bath water, we opened the thing and the baby went too, and the baby we needed. And uh, uh, so it has gone underground. And in a way, the those forces in a society which would awaken people to the spiritual dimension, which diminishes the power of the state, of the individual, because you're serving a higher master, which is the same thing as uh, uh, Jesus's discussions with um, uh, with Herod, with you know, with the uh, with the uh, uh, the Roman forces and the Jewish elders and so on in those times. It was the fact that he was serving another force that that made him willing to die, and and once they don't have the power of death. Do you see? That's the final power. If you don't do good, I'll take your life away. And you say, go ahead, baby. That's your karmic problem, not mine. And that really shakes the whole game. I mean, when enough people play, and that's exactly what Gandhi was teaching in nonviolence. In nonviolence. And that was the power of his movement. He was saying there was a higher force. So um, when we deal with the tryptamines, which are mind manifesting or allow you to set aside your habitual ways of looking at things for a moment in order to see freshly, to regain innocence, to see without the imposition of conceptual structure. It allows you to see how imprisoned you have been by a traditional structure of mind. And you get to the point where you can work with the structures of mind, which is your ego structure, really, or your structure of self, you can work with it without being entrapped in it. And that's what the psychedelics are about. And they, under the conditions where you have been doing your practice and you are either schooled in working with psychedelics or you have good guides or you have good friends that you trust in a good setting, these can be useful to remind you, Maharaji said, he said, if you're in a, he said to me, if you're in a cool place and you're feeling much peace and your mind is turned towards God, it could be useful. See, that's the sacramental use. He said, it would allow you to come in and have the darshan of Christ and you could be in the presence of spirit. He said, you can only stay two hours <laughs> because it's not the real thing, the real samadhi, but it's useful. And I really hear that just that way. I don't hear it as the final method, but I hear it as a reminder to reawaken you once again. And I've used it that way. I've taken LSD maybe once every couple of years. Uh, under which circumstances and to what extent uh, can psychedelics be an enhancer of the uh, process, process of the evolution of consciousness? And what are the risks? And what are, what? What are the risks in are the using risks? psychedelics for this? When is it appropriate to use psychedelics and what are the risks? Uh, for those of you that have just joined us, I know some new people have arrived. <laughs> and that's an interesting question to start off with. Um, and some of you might not even know what psychedelics are. So let me start more generally. Um, Way, since ancient times, there has been known even probably the Eleusinian mysteries in the West and uh, uh, the idea of the con of the 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 elixir called soma in the East. There has been um, reports of the use of um, various natural herbs and medicines that are used in rituals for um, religious, um, for uh, religious transformation experiences, for initiations. And um, usually the initiate is very well prepared for this with um, fasting, with study, with um, a ritual in which they are led through it by a guide or a priest. In, uh, in Spanish, in the Mexico, for example, it's called a corandero. 
And um, some of these uh, chemicals, for example, are found in mushrooms, certain mushrooms. Uh, one of them is called in Spanish the Tiananacto, or flesh of the gods. And it is used um, in some countries for um, to allow a medicine man to do, medicine person to do healing, or allow them to have oracular powers to see beyond or see more deeply into or understand more about the universe or about another person. Um, so there's a very ancient history about the use of such chemicals. Um, in recent times, starting in, uh, it really goes back a long time, but um, um, in the recent experiences, uh, back in the 40s in France, um, and then in Mexico and a number of places, there started to be renewed interest in this by Western scientists and uh, by botanists to understand how these chemicals work on the mind. And um, in Switzerland, in uh, Basel, Switzerland, a man by the name of Albert Hoffman, who was the head of research for the Sandoz Pharmaceutical Company, was working with some chemicals that um, were to be used for um, in relation to um, women's menstrual cycles and pregnancy. And um, he, um, he got some of the chemical, a very tiny amount of this chemical. He was working with ergot, which is a, uh, it comes from a mold that grows on rye wheat. And he got a very tiny amount of this on his uh, fingers. And whether it got to his mouth or his nostrils or just went in through his fingers. And he began to feel very strange. He didn't associate it with what he got on his fingers, but he felt very strange. And he went home to bed. And then he began to think of the relationship between these things. And so the next day he tried some more of it. And he... Uh, realized that what he had come across was a chemical that profoundly altered his consciousness. Now, um, that started a... Uh, already, people had prior, previously in the West been using um, peyote, which is a cactus, a bud from a cactus, and been using um, um, the mushrooms. And now, with the ergot, the LSD, which was called LSD-25, which was a much more powerful one than either of those other chemical substances. Okay, that's the history. Um, the effect of those chemicals, although it isn't precisely known, it appears to work on the um, synapses of the nerve fibers, where the nerve fibers meet, which is usually coded. Uh, it's encoded that we learn a coding. We, we train our nerve fibers, if you will, into habits of thought so that when, when I hold this up, you see hand, for example, and you say hand. And that association, when you were a baby and I held this up, you didn't see hand. You just saw light and dark, and then you learned the term hand or whatever language you learned it in. And then when I hold this up, you see that and as if you see hand immediately. But actually, that's a whole encoding of your brain that does that, and it happens extremely fast. I'm like, are you hearing this all? So um, what this chemical seemed to do was that it seemed to override those codes to allow you to look freshly at the universe with the same innocence that a baby might look at it and begin and then as the chemical wore off and you came back into your how it didn't destroy the habits it just set them aside for the moment it overrode them and as those habits came back in you would begin to see the way you were if you will 
you would see the structure of your ego or the structure of your mind's way of defining the universe because there are there, are, there is an immense amount of stimulation any moment, and what you choose to see is only a tiny fragment of what's available in the universe, and that's efficient for survival, but it also makes you walking a very narrow path through reality. It's not, and you keep beginning to see, as you come back into your normal waking consciousness, you see the way in which your mind is defining your reality. Like you and I, are each walking through an entirely different universe. I mean, if you had, for example, a good father figure, when you see a man, you have one reaction. If you had a bad father figure and you see a man, you have another reaction. If you were uh, scared by a dog as a child, when the dog comes towards you, you have one reaction. If you were not, if you always had a puppy when you were a baby and you played with it and a dog comes towards you, you have another reaction. These are learned responses based on your habits and your history. And so for somebody who's afraid of dogs, you just assume everybody's afraid of dogs because you've never known not to be afraid of dogs. For somebody that isn't, you can't even understand somebody that might be. So in a way, this was a great leveler. It allowed people to come out of their egocentric predicament for a moment and see the universe freshly. And the predicament is that as you develop a model of who you are and how the universe works, it's extremely hard to get out of that, and it, which is called the ego, really. It's very hard to get out of that. And what the chemical allows you to do is set that aside for a moment and see the universe from a different vantage point and find places in yourself which is why it was used in religious traditions, find the deeper parts of your being that lie behind your thinking mind. Now, hear clearly that when those chemicals were used historically, they were used in ritual and they were used sacramentally. They were used as a sacrament. One of the things that happens is that the way we live life, we have muted our senses a great deal in order to not overwhelm, be overwhelmed by stimulation. There is so much stimulation available, our ears, our eyes, our nose, our skin, it's all receiving. And because it is so much, we, our minds start to rule down so we don't notice a lot of stuff. We just don't notice anything. For example, at this moment, if I just say to you, feel the sensations in your left elbow. Now, don't move your elbow. Just feel it. Feel your left elbow. See the subtle sensations it's sending to your nervous system, to your brain. It's just the fibers, the nerve fibers at the end of the elbow are being constantly affected by the tiny chemical changes that are occurring at the tip of the nerve fibers that are happening from the wind or the air or very subtle things. And so there is sensation there. And that's happening from everywhere in your body and your auditory nerves and your, no your olfactory and your taste buds. They're all firing and doing all this stuff all the time. But most of the time, until I mentioned your left elbow, probably none of you were thinking of your left elbow. The minute I mentioned it, you could not not think about it. And so the question is, how do you deal when you're in a sea of information all the time? And what the mind does is it just ignores 99% of it to take the information that it feels is necessary for the next action. And that would be wonderful if you could turn off that monitoring system at some time and go back to the full freshness. But the problem is that you've learned efficiency at the cost that you can't turn it off. And the thinking mind starts to rule you. The efficiency starts to determine how you can see the universe. Is this clear? Now, um, so what the chemicals allowed you to do 
was to step aside from that and get a fresh look, if you will, at the universe. Now, but it also intensified sensation immensely. So if you were listening to music, instead of hearing it very thinly, it started to take on a richness. In fact, it was so rich that when you were listening to music, it would affect, it would cross sense, sense areas, and so you would see the music as well as hearing it. If you were looking at a painting, you would hear the painting as well as seeing it. In other words, it would stimulate across sense domains, which we don't allow with our usual mind. We have it narrowed down, so you think and you see and you smell and you taste. And uh, when these boundaries break down, you begin to see the interrelatedness of everything in the universe. You see the way in which it all is connected with what you start to see the the mystery that lies behind the apparent phenomena of the universe. Well, what happened was that um, these things were immediately attractive. When they started to enter into the Western culture in recent times, they started, they came in through, as I say, historically through religious ritual. But in modern times, they started to be used by, um, by artists, by musicians, because they intensified and enhanced and made fresh the nature of sound and visual information and gave them uh, tremendous creative breakthroughs in the way they saw things. And if you study the history of artists, you will find that through many techniques, they altered their chemistry chemically in order to shift their perceptual field. I mean, the history of drunkenness among the great artists is well known. I mean, uh, many of them died from very heavy alcohol use, from liver failure. Um, the use of um, hashish, the use of opium, uh, the use of any number of these chemicals which alter consciousness was used. Uh, jazz musicians are well known for their use of chemicals in order to free up their inhibitions and also allow them to feel, enter into the sensory domain in a different way. So now you have a different use of it. Not only do you have the use of it as a religious sacrament for plumbing the depths of the mystery of, of existence, but you now also have it for creative action, for increasing sensory and aesthetic experience. Now you also have it, you add on to that, the appreciation of aesthetics. So now somebody that's listening to music alters their consciousness to hear the music more fully, not to create it, but to hear it. So now you've got a third category. Okay, And you can see what's happening in society when you have that. That people, once it breaks out of the religious mold and the sacramental mode and moves into the aesthetic, uh, the creative mode, that's another group of population using it. And then once it moves from that into the aesthetic appreciation mode, it moves into another population, subpopulation, to intensify sensory experiences. Well, the chemicals move from being uh, very esoteric to being much more of a street phenomenon and started to be used extensively in the 60s by um, young people to enhance and intensify their sensory experiences. The added predicament with this, is this too long-winded or can you? The added predicament with this was that if you have a society that is based upon a, um, a set of social institutions for keeping the society organized, keeping it orga from chaos. And there is a structure, there are in social institutions that have a vertical power structure. If you take these chemicals, what happens is the way you were trained, the way you were socialized as a child, 
was that here were these very powerful beings called parents, and you are very little. And you were trained to believe in authority. They know what's best. The predicament when you take these chemicals is that you experience an inner validity to your own intuitive. You get in touch with your own intuitive voice, which feels to you as valid and powerful as anything you hear from external to yourself. And you begin to trust what you feel inside, and therefore you raise questions about the external social institutions. So from a society's point of view, these are a threat to the social structure. You can see how that would work, right? So when a group of young people or a significant segment of a population starts to experiment with these chemicals for altering their consciousness, even if they're physiologically safe, they are socially dangerous. And it takes the society only a little while to realize that people are much less controllable when they have had an experience of intuitive validity. They're willing to say, I don't agree. I mean, look what happened to me, for example. I was a professor at Harvard University in a very reputable institution. I had spent my whole life wanting to get there. I was a, and it was a very highly valued position in the United States. And I had the promise of permanent position till I died there. And I could just become old Mr. Chips. Uh, it was lovely. And my pipe, smoke my pipe and do my whole number. And um, then I had these chemicals. And when I had the chemical, I touched a part of myself that made me question the whole social structure and not be willing to play by the rules anymore. Because something was more intuitively valid to me, a part of me that I met was more intuitively valid than the part of me that had been part of the social game. In other words, I met something behind my own ego. And it didn't make me want to throw over Harvard necessarily, but it made me value these inner experiences. And that was so, finally, the use of these chemicals at Harvard was so seductive that pretty soon all the graduate students wanted to explore with these in the psychology department. And um, pretty soon it was all too volatile. And uh, to stop it, um, I was fired from Harvard. In the course of our work there, um, well, I won't tell you all the research, one of the studies was called the Good Friday Study, which is an interesting study. It concerns the sacramental use of the chemicals. That um, on Good Friday, 20 theological students from a seminary, a nearby seminary, were divided into two groups. I mean, it, it as a research thing, they didn't know which groups they were in. Half of them were given these, this chemical, this mushroom, in a pill form, psilocybin. And half of them were given a placebo. That is something that made their skin feel funny, but didn't affect their consciousness. And then they all were placed in the basement room of the Boston University Chapel, where the Friday services were being beamed in through speakers. So these are theology, these are seminary students who are hearing the Good Friday service, some of whom are on psilocybin and some of whom aren't. It's called a double blind placebo study. And it was being done by an MD who was taking his PhD at the Harvard School of Divinity. Right? In other words, it was it was quite an impressive game. It involved three universities. After this experience, all of the seminarians tape recorded what happened to them during that period. Those tapes were then typed. All references to chemicals were taken out. And then the protocols 
were given to leading theologians around the United States. And they were given a checklist of nine criteria that the Bible puts forth of a religious revelatory experience. Okay? And they were to check whether these protocols reflected any of these nine criteria. Is it clear what I'm telling you? This story? Of the people who had the placebo, one of the ten people had one of the nine experiences. Of the people that had the psilocybin, nine of them had four or more of the nine criteria of a genuine religious revelatory experience. And the theologians concluded that these nine people, in their estimation, they didn't know it had anything to do with drugs, these nine people had had a genuine, in the biblical sense, a genuine religious revelatory experience. They didn't know whether this was a story from Ezekiel or where it was from. They just knew it was a protocol. Now, society had a difficult time dealing with this. In Time magazine, it was called instant mysticism, and it was, it was presented as a, in a facetious, snide way because for the religious institutions to accept the fact that somebody could have a genuine religious revelatory experience, I mean, what, what most of the religions are based upon is somebody historically having that, but nobody has them now, and the priests don't have them, and the priest class is merely helping the parishioner keep as a good person because the mystical part of the direct mystical experience has been lost in the, ex in the exoteric religious traditions. So this was quite a threat to the religious establishment. And you can imagine why, because there's a lot of power in the game. And when you shake up, when you shake up social power. So here was one example where the social power led people to have to interpret these experiences as dangerous to the society. And it was generally seen that these phenomena were dangerous to the social structures of the society. And society had to mobilize to stop it. And so what happened was that almost all of these chemicals were outlawed as fast as they appeared. And there were very creative people finding new things. And there was a complete continuous dance of outlaw and new thing and outlaw and new thing. And it went on for still till now. And at the height of it, there were tens of thousands of young people who were turning on. And as Tim Leary used to say, you turn on, you tune in, and then you drop out. You turn on, you tune in to how reality is, and then you decide you don't necessarily want to play the game of the society anymore. And then you figure out how to play in a different way. So out of that came new kinds of social structures, communes, um, bartering systems, uh, whole different social structures were starting to emerge in the 60s. Now, the result of making them illegal were two interesting phenomena. First of all, in the 60s, these chemicals were passed from hand to hand, and they were passed along with a great deal of love. And People manufactured them and then sold them at cost and passed them on, being feeling great joy that they were opening people to these experiences. As the illegality started to creep in, then a new group came into the market to manufacture, which was really organized crime, in effect. And it started, as it became anything in a society, when it becomes powerful, it attracts power players who themselves don't want to alter their consciousness. They just want to use this as a way of gaining more power within the social structure. And so it started to change. And the chemicals started to be sold at higher and higher prices, which meant that when you got a chemical, you paid too much for it, which made you paranoid as you got it. And that paranoia started to affect the nature of your experience. Because what we found out was that the, what happens when you take the chemical is a function of the set and the setting. It's a function of the set of your mind. And that's why in the religious rituals, you were prepared so carefully with fasting, with 
ritual preparation before you had the experience. To just be out at a party and somebody says, here, drink this, that's hardly a ritual preparation. I mean, it is a ritual, but it's not one that, that assures that you're going to have a profound and beautiful experience or a religious or mystical experience. And what happened was more and more young people started to use these chemicals not to have a religious revelatory, re revelatory experience. They started to use them to enhance their sensory pleasure. Started to try to use these drugs, except they were too powerful for that. And so some of them started to have bad trips. What a bad trip was, was when you took something that you thought was going to make the music great, and suddenly the universe opened up and you were at the edge of the void. You hadn't planned for that. And you got completely disoriented from that. And you started to get frightened and push away. And you had nobody to guide you and no preparation to understand what was happening to you. And you got frightened. And out of that fear came uh, resistance. And out of resistance came closing down. And then panic. And then you were... Uh, ended up often in a hospital having to be tranquilized and then coming away saying that's a ghastly thing and everybody's saying that's terrible. And the people that tranquilized you were people that never had had that chemical. So now the question is, your question is, under what conditions would you take it and what would be its um, merit? Um, and I guess I would say that when you're taking a chemical in a society that is made it illegal, first of all, you have to realize that there is an attendant paranoia to the whole phenomenon because of the social structures. Because as I said, it's set and setting. It's where your mind is at, and it's also the environmental conditions in which you take it. If you can override that, that is, you can create a system out in nature or out in a private space where you can be a setting, meaning surrounded by people who have had good experiences and who are guides or who are well understanding in this, or you yourself are well understanding. Then it is possible to use these to benefit. Then the question is, what is it you want from them? That's the set. And if the set is to enhance pleasure, that's what it will do. And then low dosages are fine because they'll allow you to go into the astral planes. If you're going to use these chemicals for profound spiritual transformation, then you're going to use higher dosages. You're going to prepare your body with fasting and with study. And then you're going to do it in the presence of a guide. And you're going to be ready to keep surrendering. What it is really is psychological death. It really has the aspect of lest ye die, ye cannot be born again. It is the really, it is an experience that is very parallel to psychological death. And we'll talk about this all in the death section we have coming up. That um, we republished the Tibetan Book of the Dead as a manual called the psychedelic experience. Psychedelic is a word which means mind manifesting. It was a term by, uh, coined by Dr. Humphrey Osmond to describe these experiences. So um, I would say that in the time that I first started to experiment with these chemicals in 1961, the society that I grew up in and that I had trained myself in, the high priests of that society had become the scientists and had become the intellectuals. And what was valued was what you knew you knew. Do you understand what I'm saying? What you intellectually knew you knew. And science set up the criteria for what you know you know. It's public, it's reproducible. So that all of the techniques of introspection, which had been part of earlier science, were rejected and things like behaviorism, where you measured things from outside. You treated the human being as an object and measured them from outside in, not from the inner experiences.
so that when I and that defined what reality was and anything you couldn't measure by scientific criteria was treated as irrelevant it was treated as um, something that our tools didn't have anything to say about so it was an error or irrelevant or unmeasurable so that the issues of the inner awareness or the soul or any of these things were not usable from science Science had nothing to say with that, about that. What happened to me was that I met a part of my being that I, as a psychologist, as a professor of human motivation and clinical pathology and so on, I knew nothing about this experience from my intellectual point of view. All my studies hadn't prepared me to understand what this thing was. The person that wrestled with this most closely in the psychological domain was Carl Jung. He really attempted to bridge the, the gap between the mystical part of ourselves and the psychological. And then Maslow, and there were a number of people after that. Then. And there were a number of philosophers, of course, that were doing this. Going back all the way to Heraclitus and... and uh, Socrates certainly played with it. Now, um, when I broke through, what I saw was that the reality that I thought was real was only relatively real. It wasn't absolutely real. What happened to my mind was a shift in consciousness that was very parallel to what Einstein did to Newtonian physics. Newtonian physics treated a certain realm of reality as absolutely real, and Einstein said it all depends on where you're standing. That is real under certain conditions and other conditions it isn't real. The reason I bring all that up is because over the years since that early 60s experience, the culture has changed. The worldview has changed. Relative reality is a much more acceptable place of consciousness than it was before. The intellect doesn't quite have the domain, the overriding power that it once had. People are aware of the limits of technology and science much more than they were 20 years ago even. The result is that chemicals are more of an anachronism now. They are less necessary to alterations of consciousness than they once were. I work with teenagers in uh, California, and I'm amazed to find some of these teenagers who have never taken any of these chemicals, never read Eastern philosophy. They've just grown up in rock and roll lyrics, for example. Because if you follow what happened, the way it was transmitted into mainstream society was that the rock and roll musicians started to work with these chemicals. Then their lyrics started to reflect the reality they were seeing. Millions of young people started to learn these lyrics, repeating them over and over again with emotional intensity from a teenage time when their chemistry is changing. I mean, I'm, I'm over, so showing you the overloading of a phenomena. And they, in effect, changed their worldview as a result of that and experienced the relative reality that, that the Beatles or the Rolling Stones had done chemically and they did it non-chemically through just listening to these music. And it, it got into a vast segment of society. So that, in a way, it all happened. It's all over. It's very far out. I mean, I, I, it's very hard to perceive this because everybody says, oh, you're kidding, and don't, nothing really changed. And I mean, I can do that trip too, but something did indeed happen, which makes these a little more irrelevant than they used to be because there are more, there are more spaces to play with in the culture than there were before. And in these young people, I suddenly find, like I go to the Middle West in the United States, which is a very conservative area of the country. And I give a lecture which 20 years ago I would have given only to people who had taken psychedelics because the, they would be the only ones that would understand what I was talking about. 
And now I give it to a group, and I bet 70 to 80 percent of, my, of the people in my audience have never taken any chemicals. They haven't read Eastern philosophy. And I'm saying the same thing I was saying 20 years ago, and they're all going like this. <laughs> now, and I ask myself, how do they know? How could they possibly know what I'm talking about? And then I realize that it has entered into the culture. And because it's entered into the culture, these are less relevant than they were before. Now, I will, even though there has been a lot of pressure on me because of the misuse of chemicals, in other words, what's happened is in, I'm sorry this is so long-winded, but I think this is the first chance I've had to really talk about a lot of these things, uh, not just here, but in general, this sophisticatedly. Um, we have in the United States, and it's increasingly happening now in Europe, is the crack phenomenon in which disempowered segments of society, like um, inner city blacks and other minority groups, who have very little window of opportunity where there's high unemployment, where there's very little opportunity for reaping the benefits of an affluent society, through drugs can get immediate gratification, rather than what society does in order to get itself to work is it works upon the basis of delayed gratification. That is, you get educated so later you will be able to have a car and a home and a family. And then you work hard so you can buy insurance so later when you retire you will feel secure. There's always a time-binding component in it in which you, you pay now, play later. Right? as opposed to play now and pay later, which is the, the, the crack phenomenon. And you take inner city situations now, uh, in New York City, the 11-year-olds who are selling crack are making $500 a day, while their father is making $50 a day at a regular job, and in a regular work, and they have gold thises and thats on them and and they are providing instant gratification to people who are basically frustrated in life the other segment of the society that is using these is the middle class affluent society they're using cocaine instead of crack but that's the milder form of the same thing what they're using it for is because the myths of the culture promised them that if they got the home, the car, they did it all. They delayed their gratification. If they got all that stuff, they would feel a certain way. But the problem is they don't because it's externalized stuff. It's not inner stuff. And they, they were promised if you have enough money, if you have insurance, if your children are going to the right colleges, if you have this, you will be happy, and they're not. And so there is an increase in alcoholism, there is an increase in all kinds of drug use of people who are frustrated because the fantasy was not, an, was not a real fantasy. So that's two segments of society that are very vulnerable to the use of drugs as immediate gratification, nothing to do with mysticism. That may happen along the way, but it's almost by error. So what I'm saying to you, I want to, this is the context in which we're talking. And I'm saying, yes, these have use, and they still have sacramental powerful use to taking you beyond your own model. But you've got to realize the conditions in which you're using them in, which has a certain paranoia connected with it and a certain um, cultural value and attitude towards what you're doing when you're doing that. Um, the dangers are, one is the bad trip, that you're not prepared so that you'll be frightened. Most of the dangers are psychological. The dangers primarily are not chemical. The only predicament is when you get into chemicals that are, say, opium derivatives, um, and morphine, crack, uh, things like that, uh, and from cocoa, coca plants. When you get into these, you're dealing with something that is so profoundly psychologically altering immediately that there is very quick and very powerful addiction. 
to the experience. Because if you have a lousy life, a terrible life, the reentry from this experience of immediate fulfillment and bliss when you come down is so horrible that you just want to go back. So there are two places where you bad trip. One is on the way out when it's more than you expected. The other was, is when it, on the way back when it's too horrible to re-enter into. All right? And those are two places you can get stuck. And they're two different kinds of bad trips. The physiological stuff is much more of a political game than an actuality game. There, uh, there is probably some short-term evidence that um, maybe MDMA will have some short-term suppressant effect on uh, serotonin or something like that in the brain, but nothing long-term, no long-term effects that anybody sees as yet. I mean, that's all been political stuff. It's labs that are hired by the government to demonstrate danger. Um, and we just don't have that yet. The psychological danger is that people just won't play the game of society. Kids won't get educated. And it seems to me that if I understand the spiritual sequence, you start out being part of the one with the universe, and then you're socialized into being somebody. And then you've got to get your somebody act together and get grounded and get becoming strongly somebody before you're ready to go into nobody training, which is what mysticism is about. If you try to go into nobody training before you're somebody, you lose your ground. Sorry if this is too much shorthand for some of you, but you lose your ground and the result is that you are disoriented. And you can't figure out, and a lot of kids seem like that. They take drugs when they're 11, 12, 15, and they get confused because they haven't yet become somebody, if you will. And so they can't get it together. They can't earn a living. They can't get educated. They, they, and they are, in a way, um, they're a problem for society and for themselves. So I'm in favor of discouraging young people from using chemicals until they are well entrenched in their somebodyness. Okay. Am I dealing with the question? Okay. Do you have something to say? I'll tell you, I think that any chemical, I mean, marijuana is a very mild psychedelic. It is not strong enough to override the deeper places in you that might be resisting. It won't take you in a full, full-blown mystical experience, but it certainly can release a lot of inhibition and open you and make you more sensitive. It can be useful. After a while, I want to show you that who you are is already the Buddha mind, is already Christ consciousness. Who you think you are is not, all right? You are taking a chemical to override who you think you are in order to become who you are. The predicament is that over time you build a model in your mind that who you are is not enough without the chemical. And there is an interesting way in which it ends up undermining your image of yourself. Do you hear that? At the same moment, it does enhance meditation and all that. But it's slowly, I've gotten into that. I mean, I got, I've gotten mildly addicted over years and then got out of it because I saw that it was reinforcing a feeling that I wasn't enough. I think it intensifies the, the immediate experiences around you. It just makes them all more immediate and it brings you much more, it brings you also much more into the present moment because the amount of time you spend with past and present, future time binding starts to diminish. The predicament is that you get totally preoccupied with the moment and you don't have as much awareness of the context in which the moment exists. So that people that use a lot of marijuana often become less socially conscious of the contextual framework in which they're functioning. They become an immediate intense friendship or an immediate intense experience, but they'll lose time or they'll lose their other social responsibilities. That does happen with that. That's part of the intensification.
the question is, is there any parallel between psychotic experiences and the experiences of LSD? You could look at psychosis as a person flips reality into another reality and then gets stuck in it. In the same way, we're stuck in this one. See, we're stuck in one that we all conspire to say is real. All right. So you're always faced with a situation when you're with a psychotic, is the because from the psychotic's point of view, we're all crazy. All right. Now you say, yeah, but you're paranoid. And then the question is, who's calling who what? You know, I mean, it's it, there's always those interesting issues in the profound sense. And uh, we all end up saying reality is what we'll all agree to is reality from our normal waking consciousness. Um, the way in which the chemicals work is that they, it is certainly possible to go into and have a psychotic episode with chemicals. Absolutely. Um, the fact that they loosen the hold of any model, if it works, they loosen the hold of every model. So there's, you're not standing anywhere. You're floating in and out of realities. You're not stuck in any one reality. And then as the chemical wears off, you usually get stuck back in the one you started from, right? However, uh, people do have psychotic, they go, they go into a plane of reality that's unfamiliar to them. They get frightened and their fear makes them grab and then they stay in that reality and they don't come back. And that happens in cases, but it's reasonably a small percentage that go psychotic from that. I mean, no more than going to college, I don't think. I mean, I'm, it's actually true, yeah. Is a naturally psychotic experience similar to LSD? Um, it could be, because uh, these, there is a chemistry in the body that when it works in certain ways, either through chemical imbalance or through some... Um, stimulation can be activated that actually can affect the brain in the same way as an external chemical could do that. And so that people can, there are a lot of people who naturally have mystical experiences and naturally have experiences that move them from one plane of consciousness to another. There are many women at their menstrual period that flip into other planes of consciousness. There are, there are many cases of people in trauma when their car is going over a cliff or something like that, that flip into other planes of consciousness. So there's plenty of evidence of that, that there are natural chemicals in the body that will activate. And some people very naturally just go in and out of these a lot. Yeah. Could you comment then on how you integrate chemicals and the work in the world? I would say that the uh, chemical experiences have given me a framework, an experiential framework for reperceiving the reality I live in that was so powerful. The validity, the intuitive validity of those experiences was so strong that um, they have colored the way I have looked at reality ever since that time. And that as I have had there were a lot of experiences that all of us have all the time that most of us treat as I was out of my mind or it was irrelevant or I'm just uh, overtired or something, uh, I'm confused, which suddenly start to make sense to you so they're not treated as irrelevant anymore because you now have a new context for understanding them. That's one thing that's very clear to me. That's one effect. The next effect that I would say is that um, at times when I have gotten stuck in the way I see reality, chemicals have given me, uh, have broken my set to allow me to see freshly again. Um, they have over years become less and less relevant and less and less interesting to me because I have changed my life more and more to be in harmony with the way in which I know the universe to be through psychedelics. So that if I smoke pot or if I take MDMA or if I take acid, it's all kind of interesting, but it's kind of irrelevant. 
and I don't like the hangover and I don't like the effects on my body because it definitely has an effect on your neurophysiological body because you are over if it if it affects you at all it's overriding something and giving you energies that you don't have usually available and in a way you pay for it later there is a a payment you can feel a uh, refractory period a kind of fatigue there is something where then you have to use more of it the next day to get yourself back into the same space and that's where addiction comes from generally so and I meet people that have smoked grass every day for 20 years and they get up in the morning and the first thing they do is have a joint and it's lovely but they're hooked I mean it's not and the f result is that and they I had an interesting experience when I gave lectures for many years not anymore but when I gave lectures for many years I used to smoke a puff of a joint before I give the lecture because I was under the impression that when I smoked the joint my mind opened up and I was more creative and more connected to spirit and that I owed it to the people that had come to hear me to be as much as I could be for them I couldn't take acid because I'd lose it too much I had one great experience when I lost it with uh, acid I this was back in the 60s and I was uh, speaking at a club in San Francisco and I took LSD in the afternoon and the timing was wrong so that I was peaking or coming to the high point as I came out on the stage and um, <laughs> there were about 300 people out in the audience and um, uh, I didn't know what I was doing out on the stage, which was the first problem. And I had been, I had been at the ocean all day, and all I saw were these ocean waves. So uh, I said, "Are there any questions?" Which uh, was all I could think of to do. And this fish raised its hand, and <laughs> this fish had on a vest and a tie and a jacket, and it stood up and it said. Um, it started going blah, 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 and I realized there were words coming out, and I focused, and it was asking me a question. This was back in the 60s about hypothalamus and serotonin and a lot of stuff. And what I heard was this poor fish saying to me, do you love me? <laughs> Basically. I mean, I was cutting through all the stuff, you know. <laughs> so at the end, he sat down, and I said to him, yes, I love you. And he stood up and he says, that doesn't satisfy me at all. <laughs> and then I knew one of us was in deep trouble. <laughs> so I was under the impression that, um, that taking psychedelics was affecting my presentations. And so... Um, I mean, the uh, marijuana, like a puff. And so this friend of mine, this woman told me very clearly, Judith Stanton, she said, you know, you're under this impression, but she says, I think you're absolutely wrong. I think that all that happens is that your judgment about yourself changes, not the actual nature. You, your standards get lowered so that everything you, you say, yes, and it seems like, yes, you know, I mean, it all becomes very profound. While it isn't actually any more profound, what you're saying isn't any more profound than if you weren't smoking. It's just that your judgments about it have changed. <clears throat> the dangers of being overwhelmed by bad psychological stuff. It's called bad tripping, yeah. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, excuse me. I think that if you're going to use powerful psychedelic agents, with mild ones, you will come up to the edge of your deeply repressed material. But usually the mild ones won't force you into it. They'll just force you up to the edge of it, and you'll feel some fear, but you'll push against it. When you use more powerful psychotropic agents, like LSD, you will be forced into those. The mystical place you're looking for is behind those things, going through the unconscious into the superconscious or into the whatever you want to call that place behind it. Now, um, the preparations to avoid that are having a guide with whom you are sharing the truth so clearly that when that stuff comes up, you can share that, you can open with that person and go with that and you can go if the chemical is powerful enough 
it actually takes you right through that so fast you don't have a chance to get neurotic. I mean, I'm, this is when it's really powerful. It just goes so fast. If it's less powerful, you can go into the psychologically repressed stuff and get really depressed, frightened. It will imprint. You will have a bad trip. You'll probably have about 10 hours of hell. You'll come back. You'll say, I never want to use that again. And it'll probably take you several months to get over the trauma of having opened to that stuff. That's usually the way it works with those kinds of bad trips. It's not a permanent thing, except in very rare cases, very rare cases where it opens something the person can't deal with and they have a psychotic flip that they don't return from. That's the probabilities of that are reasonably slight, but that does happen. It does happen. And as I say, the way to avoid that is through preparation, through a guide, through trusting your own intuitive heart as to whether or not you should be doing this or not. When somebody, I never say to somebody, you should take this chemical. I will prepare them and tell them, educate them as to what I understand about all of it. And then I say to them, trust your heart. And even if we made all preparations and they arrive and they've traveled a great distance and, they're, and they say, I'm feeling a little uncertain, I say, then don't. Because that uncertainty, if you feel you've been pushed into it by social pressure or by expectation and you don't feel right for it, those are real good conditions for having a bad trip. And each person knows what they should avoid. They know what they can handle. I really trust that. I would never decide what another human being should do with their consciousness. I don't feel I have a moral right to do that. I don't have a right to say, you shouldn't take this medicine because you aren't stable enough. I'll say, this is what happens. And if they say to me, do you think I should take the medicine? I may say no or yes. But I generally will not say anything about that. It's up to the individual. Because each individual human heart knows what they should do. I really trust that. It is not necessary at all for people. It is not necessary at all for mystical experience. It's not necessary for transformation. Neither is a guru. Neither is meditation. These are all practices. They're all methods and they're all traps. Everyone is a trap. All right? So I could give the same thing for meditation and you could say, well, I get a feeling you're saying it's necessary. I don't think it's necessary. It's just another method. All right, we've got to go on because we've got a group here with questions and we, we're running behind in time. That answers your question, I take it. <laughs> Next. I've been uh, smoking pot for 22 years. I've uh, been able to be in the witness position with it. I've seen that, um, for me, it has been a very good medicine. It has been part of high openings, and um, it's helped me in my playfulness and um, in creativity. Um, some of my best shamanic journeys. It's been good for me in a lot of ways. I have not um, felt, most of the time, a guilt around it. I felt good about it. Um, in the last few years, between a lot of the politicized media hypes about it and just the whole war on drugs coming down, um, I've begun to feel somewhat confused about whether I am in a state of denial about it or whether I can be the um, responsible aware, open to human being that I feel I am and be a pot smoker. Can you address that from your enlightened perspective? <laughs> <laughs> Clearly, um, you and I both see how um, um, pot can be a method for um, opening you to receiving and tuning to planes that are not available to you all the time. But that raises an interesting question of whether or not the use of something to come into some place is reinforcing the fact that you aren't it without it. And it's very interesting to examine who you are without it as much without getting into a value judgment that it's bad. It's just, it's like every method is a trap. It's like meditators get addicted to their meditation. And the game isn't to become a meditator, the game is to be free. 
and it's free of your method, whatever the method is. So the interesting question is to examine, like if you take, and you may have done that, like you take a six-month break from it, and then you see where you are, what you're doing, what's, what's about. You've got to give it long enough for it to get out of your system and get all the effects. Um, I have noticed in my own life, and that's my chemistry, and it can't be ex extrapolated to other people necessarily, but I'll share it with you, that um, if I'm in a situation and I say, if I took a joint, I could be, this situation could be more. Um, and I do it, and I experience it being more, First of all, the next day is less, okay? So that in order to make the next day more, I have to take dope again to make the next day more. That's the first thing I've noticed about myself. I'm not, so I said, don't extrapolate, I'm just giving you this. That there is a cost. There's a cost in, in my wanting more of this moment. I don't get it free in my body chemistry because there's a refractory period and then I have to smoke more to do it. Now, there are a couple of other things about that moment where I want more. Like, I used to feel that when I smoked, and I, for years, I would take a puff of a joint before I gave a lecture. Because, basically, I felt that people were asking me to connect them with the Spirit, and I felt that what I was wasn't enough for what they were asking. But if I took a puff of a joint, I would do something which would make what I offered them more. And I was said, in my mind, I was smoking that joint as an offering to them. I used to say, I don't want this stuff. I've got to take it for them. Okay. <laughs> Judith, who was a very old and dear friend, said to me one day, you know, you're under the illusion that when you smoke, what you say is more profound and more spiritually true than when you don't smoke. She says, I do not find that to be true, and she has listened to me ad nauseum. Okay. <laughs> and when I analyzed that, I realized that what changed when I smoked was my judgment about what I was saying, not what I was saying. That I was saying the same thing, I was having the same experience, but I was not as harsh on myself about it, so I was feeling different. And that had a f cyclical feedback. If I say, bloop, and then I don't say, well, that wasn't too good. If I say that wasn't too good, I get tight, and then the next thing I say is a result of that tightness, and then I start a whole sequence of getting tighter and tighter. While if I say, bloop, and then I say, gee, that was pretty good, <laughs> then I open up, and then the next thing is more open. and more. So in a way, there are these cycles that spin back, and I do, uh, independent of what Judith says, think that I sometimes am wiser with dope than without it. Um, however, I, I, it affected me a lot when she said that because I, I began to realize that that was feeding my own sense of inadequacy, that my use of dope was feeding my own sense of inadequacy. And I started to say, in effect, to people, look, this is who I am and this is what I am, and if it's not enough, don't come. Don't come back. This is what I am. Because it's weird when people have paid to be in your presence for you to enunciate wisdom. It's a funny role. I mean, and I know, I know the hype of it, and we all know, but still it's going on. It's still it's happening. And part of my problem with dope was the illegality of it. That I had to have it knowing that I couldn't share the fact that I had it with other people because I was jeopardizing my own freedom by doing that. So that had a cost. There was a cost in having a method which was illegal. Okay, that's part of it. Not that illegality is appropriate or right, but there was a cost in it. Um, I respect the fact that people use chemical, that people can use chemicals sacramentally and use them in a way to open and bring them close to the Spirit. And I think that you have to be, you're doing it pretty well, the way I hear you talking about it. You just have to be willing to be very straight with yourself. 
to examine again and again whether you're copying out. There is no long-term physiological damage that anybody knows about. No, there's no brain damage. I mean, the research is just abs. I've been through it. I've studied it. And some of my most profound friends at Johns Hopkins, at Harvard and all, have studied the data. And it is no stuff about human and brain damage. Okay. Hmm? Well, what it does is it shifts motivation. Things that you thought were important aren't, and other things are. And it's not clear whether that's so bad, you know? It's not so bad. It gets you out of the, the kind of a motivational patterns that the culture, that it doesn't make you as adaptable to the cultural motivational scheme. It's not so bad, you know? I'm not sure. It sure does shift motivation, absolutely. What about what? Depression? Well, that's, that's an individual matter, that some people, when they use chemicals, the, either they go into a depression or they... What it does, it's interesting that... You're talking about depression when you use it or depression afterwards? Maybe, maybe what? Five years after? No, I wouldn't think it is psychogenically linked. I don't think it's psychedelically linked. Oh, yeah, sure, you can have a depression afterwards. I mean, the depression can be psycho psychogenic in the sense that you see the beauty of what it's like not to have those inhibitions, and then you get caught back in and you feel lousy. Uh, or it can be purely chemical. It can be that your body used up certain chemicals and that in the refractory period, when those chemicals are absent, you go into a depression. That can be, it can be somatogenic as well as psychogenic. Sure, that can happen. Um, yeah. I think it's interesting and you want to trust yourself, be aware of the paranoia in the culture, uh, be aware of the data, be aware of the shifts in the way in which you fit into the world. I mean, I have watched people take drugs and lose interest in most of the things of life and drop out of school and do all those things and you say, gee whiz, that's a drug casualty. And then I see them 15 years later and they came out and they went through mental hospitals and all that stuff and I see them 15 years later and they're more of a mensch than somebody that went through the whole Harvard curriculum and graduate school and all that stuff. You know, I don't want to advocate it because I mean it's too, any simplistic thing isn't the right thing but you really have to see the game is more interesting than the one that the narrow band that the, that the culture defines as appropriate behavior. Yeah. I think it, I'll tell you something. What's shifted in me was for the first 15 years after 1961, when I first turned on and, and realized and, and opened to the spirit, and, and it was drugs that did it for me. After that, always what I wanted to do was come back into that sweetness. And then there was a point where I wanted to get free more than I wanted to get high. And I became more interested in what brings me down than what gets me out there. And I started to work with my lows, with my depression, with my sadness, with the deadness. And I'd be in a situation, I'd say, this is really boring. And I know if I took a joint, it would open it all up and I'd see the beauty again. And then I'd say, no, I'll just, this is really boring. And I'd sit with the boring and as I opened into the boringness, the beauty would be there. And I began to see that I was always afraid of the states when I wasn't turned on because they weren't enough. And I had to deal in my mind with that thing of more is better, which is a state of mind. And I just wanted to play with it. And I began to see that as I stopped feeding that more is better and shift to enough is enough, it starts to shift and I'm not motivated to constantly keep changing my consciousness for it to be enough. I've really been working with enoughness and it isn't always wonderful and sometimes it's remarkable and sometimes without dope I'm just like blown away by the beauty and the preciousness of it all too. I just, and so all I'm saying is you've just got to examine how you're using it and what it's feeding in your long-term game of your journey into being a free human being. So. I thought that I would come to Chapman College in Orange County for this. 
My mind just can't grok it. I can't get it all together. The climate must have changed when I wasn't looking. Boy, if this climate existed back in the 60s, Harvard could really be swinging today. <laughs> huh. You know, this audience in particular, I can say to you, there are so many levels on which we could share. You know, we could just sit here silently for about a half hour and uh, probably have the essence of the wisdom. Because obviously, um, well, it's obvious to me, I don't really know a hell of a lot more about all this than you do. And those of you that have heard my lectures know that I use my first name, Ram, as an acronym for rent-a-mouth. <laughs> and basically, I just think of myself as a, a mouth that speaks what we are trying to figure out and understand. And uh, Because when I say something that's about as wise as I get, I look out and, and a lot of people are going like that. And I think, how do they know? And if they know, why am I up here saying it? I particularly like speaking to very conservative groups where I'm introduced with everything except psychedelics. <laughs> you know, he was at Harvard and then he did research on consciousness and went to India and they, what happened? Something's missing, you know? And I, <clears throat> I get up and I say the most significant single event of my life happened on March 6, 1961, when Tim Leary gave me psilocybin. And I can feel that the lips get very tight. And I say, I've taken it hundreds of times since then, LSD and all of the mishpacha. And uh, so you must assume that I must, that anybody that's done that must be psychotic. But I would point out that you paid to come and hear me. <laughs> it's like what goes around comes around. That when I, when I was a professor at Harvard, I was a good guy. Then I was fired from Harvard for turning on people. And then I was a bad guy. And then I became a yogi, and I was a crazy guy. And then slowly, I've done service work all these years, and I have foundations, and now I'm a good guy again. And you can just realize, see, the, you're running through a minefield of the perceptions of other people. But it boils down to what you feel inside yourself. All the, uh, Houston Smith said, um, he said, it's clear that, I think I've got it written down, he said, um, LSD produces the re a religious experience, but it's less evident that it produces a religious life. And I've been examining that, and I realize, that, of course, it's less evident because you don't have any criteria for measuring that very simply. But I think I could say quite honestly that what happened to me in 1961 was so, whatever it was, I am still growing into it now, that it has guided the course of my life. that it, it cut through at such a profound level my ability to keep people as them. And though I've tried, because this culture is very good at keeping everybody as them, so that you're almost totally alienated, whatever it was that happened to me then keeps undercutting that ability to distance myself from other people in my mind, 
without realizing that I'm doing a mind trip on myself. Because the inner validity of the experience of us was so profound. And us, then the next step out on the next plane of consciousness is one. That there's only one awareness, one awareness manifesting through all these different consciousnesses. And then over the years, as I enter into that one, there's no longer a one because there's no longer a two. Now, as I played with these planes of consciousness for the last 30 years, Many, many times I saw myself trying to stand somewhere in the whole process, like getting high. I mean, I really love to get high. And for many years, I got high as often as I could. And I don't think it was until probably the middle 70s that I started psychedelics in 61 that I began to see that as long as high represented a polarity from low or down, I was still stuck in pushing something away. And that if I were going to be free, and that was the shift, the significant next shift that happened to me, was the recognition that I didn't want to just get high where I was always off balance for fear I'd come down. I wanted to be free. And I recognized that free meant that I couldn't be standing anywhere. Or conversely, in the language you and I can understand, I must be standing everywhere. So at that point, I saw an interesting thing that no longer did I just want to get high. I wanted to be free. And the most powerful vehicle for my getting free was figuring out what brought me down since my natural state was high also. That is what caught me in the physical, psychological planes. So I did about a 180 degree turn instead of always trying to get into la-la land, into vast oneness, into bliss, into rapture, I started to dive down into the stuff that would catch me. Because as I worked with my mind through meditation and all these different games, I began to hear uh, Buddha's statement that the cause of suffering is the clinging of mind. That the way awareness clings to something through aversion or attraction. And I wanted to free my awareness from identification. Now, it's easy to do that in a cave. You got nothing that brings you down. But try living in the city. Try living in the city with your family. Try living in the city with your family and having a job. Try living in a city with your family having a job in the United States. I mean, I can keep going. I mean, you like this one? Try that one. So they get fiercer and fiercer. It's much easier to stay high in a village in India, economics and all, than it is in orange well i don't know about orange considering this i don't i really don't know about orange <laughs> hmm. so the question 
for me was what to go towards. And I saw that of all the things that would get me, like money, power, sex, um, whatever, I stop there because that covers enough. Death is a good one. See, I could see that death was such a no-no in our culture that people were so freaked about death and that somehow because of that psilocybin and all the rest of the LSD, there was something that happened in me. I didn't have that same fear and denial and all, all the business about death. Partly I picked up in India through my guru and through my training all the ideas about reincarnation, but there was no question that awareness was not an identity with the physical being. And I had been a Harvard professor in which there was no question, but that I, awareness was part, was a, an identity with the brain. So I started to just uh, kind of randomly started to hang out with dying people. Because it was the thing that brought me closest to the edge of the mystery where almost without exception, everybody in our culture has an aversive identification, pushing it away. And um, Ralph and Tim and mainly them, I was just, my name was used, but um, did the psychedelic experience, which was um, a translation of the Tibetan Book of the Dead as a manual for having a psychedelic experience, for a death-rebirth experience, because the parallels were obvious. So I realized that what, just like you say, lest ye be born again, you have to die before you're born again. And I saw that my process was dying to who I thought I was. Who I thought I was must die for who I am to be. Who I am could include who I thought I was, but it couldn't, my, who I thought I was couldn't exclude everything else. So I worked with death, and I've worked with that now for years and years. I feel like a Charles Adams cartoon. I get excited when I'm going to be with somebody dying. Because it's a place where most of the defenses and the will start to dissolve, and there's like this space in which if the person isn't fr surrounded by people that are freaking themselves about death, there are these openings of consciousness that are just breathtaking. And the person, it's as if you watch a, a, a baby chick being born, you watch the shell break. It, it's just brilliant. It's the closest I get to truth with another human being is being with somebody as they die. Because there's nowhere to hide, there's no need to hide. The only person that would be hiding would be me. It's a situation that demands no bullshit. You've just got to be there and be there in truth. And if you're frightened, say, I'm frightened. And I'd say that for the past 15 years, what I have been practicing doing, and this is, this is a line Paul can use, I'm sure, is loving people to death. Falling into love with them. Being with them without definition of boundary. Extricating my awareness from the identification with me as a separate entity, as a helper, as a do-gooder, as kind Ramdas helping this poor person. Cutting through poor persons, cutting through until it's just two beings. You here, I'm here. What's happening today? Well, I'm dying. Wow, that's interesting. I'm dying too. It's just a longer term game. What's it like dying? Well, I'll tell you, it's scary. And I, really? 
And it's as if we make contact with that in us which has nothing to do with death. Awareness neither comes nor goes. It was neither born nor it dies. It's neither here nor there. So, when you're working with what brings you down, and you do it through mindfulness practice, all kinds of techniques of doing this, there is a toxicity that builds up. It gets to you after a while. There's toxic fumes, so to speak, from, from the stuff you work with all the time. So every two years or so, I've taken LSD or psilocybin or mushrooms or something for a couple of motives. Partly, I'm sure, to remain, keep my dues, my membership in the club. And partly because I am a research person also, and, and I'm very curious because since I understand the, re- the way in which set is a, such a powerful variable along with setting and determining what kind of psychedelic experience you have, after two years I've gone through a lot of changes and my set or my launching pad is a different place and I want to see what else I have to learn. And while it's difficult in a paranoid society to find a non-paranoid setting, so sometimes I'm in the Polynesian islands or somewhere as my laboratory setting. And uh, what those experiences have been like often is a reminder once again of what I forgot. A reminder of the way I got stuck yet again. Because here I am doing all this stuff with, like working with homeless, working in the Guatemalan highlands with people whose, all their relatives have been murdered, working with the blind in Nepal and India. And I'm not a good guy. I'm just doing that because it keeps me close to the edge of that stuff. I'm working on myself. I'm not doing that out of a, Um, narcissistic me generation mentality either. I understand that if I try to help you and I'm busy being somebody trying to help you, I'm like Typhoid Mary. What I am giving you is forcing you into being somebody being helped. But between helper and helped, here we are behind it. But my mind is an environment that's trapping your consciousness. And so in a funny way, even as I help you, I'm creating suffering in you. I'm isolating you. So I begin to see very more and more clearly that I have to work on myself to become more spacious in order to be available to you, to free you to do what you need to do. So that my actions with you, whatever they happen to be, whether I'm holding you as your die or or having an administrative discussion with you, or buying gas from you, or whatever. That my consciousness is not creating an environment that that catches you, that catches you in having to be somebody. You see it particularly in dying. Like my dad he got to be 88, and my stepmother had died, and we'd been through all that together. And he got very quiet inside. And he just smiled a lot. And my father was not that kind of a person. He was an actor, an achiever, an upwardly mobile person that was always, well, Rich, what will we do today? We were always hammering something, lopsided, as I recall. <laughs> we had to do something all the time. And here we were now just hanging out, holding hands, looking at the sunset. And he had this kind of shit-eating grin on his face all the time. And we'd wash him and worship him and oil him. And he never said anything. He'd just smile all the time. So my brother came over who had a hard time with my father. He went in and said, hi, Dad, how are you doing? And my father didn't say anything, just smiled. And my brother went out and said, bastard still won't speak to me. (laughs) 
And then my aunt, who loved him passionately, came in and said, oh, George, how are you? And he just smiled at her. And she says, what's happened to you? Where have you gone? What have they done to you? He was happy. I was happy. They were both miserable. And they were miserable because he wasn't who he used to be, who wasn't even that nice a guy. And it's interesting to allow your mind to be fresh moment to moment to moment to moment to moment. So you give a ch person a chance to be who they are now, not who you've got them pegged as who they ought to be. I was, uh, this fellow would come to all my lectures up in the Bay Area and he was, he was, uh, in a wheelchair, but he just wasn't in a wheelchair. He was back in the wheelchair like this and he would drool a lot. And his legs were spread out, and he had an attendant with him all the time, and he was choking in the lectures often. So I went over to say hello to him after the lecture, and and I met Kelly. And I started to visit with Kelly and hang out with him. Kelly could only speak because you could hold his finger over an alphabet board, and he could do letter by letter. He had been 11 years old, and he had been hit in the side of the head by a in a, in a fight at a baseball game and the hospital misdiagnosed it and he ended up like this he would now when i first knew him he was in his late 20s he'd been through college he'd been through college needed a full-time attendant 24 hours a day extraordinary guy it took me six months of visiting him every It took me six months um, of visiting him every couple of weeks before I could be with that being without getting reactive to the physical trip his body was going through this life. And the minute I did that, I kept finding him in there deeper and deeper and deeper. But his symbolic value was so powerful that it took me, and I've really been training myself a hell of a long time to get through it. I mean, because, I, and then we could meet behind it, and then he could say, I'm having a hell of a time with my anger and my horniness in here, you know, because I'm in this body that doesn't do this stuff. And we talked from in there until pretty soon, even though he was speaking through the alphabet board, I never even noticed it anymore. It was just a form of communication. We were just hanging out together. Now you can see who in the society has symbolic value that's so powerful that you never can get through it. Like because I'm a Jewish boy from Boston, upwardly mobile, money has always been a thing with me. My father always loved rich, important men. So if I'm in a room with five people and one of them's rich, I can see God in four people and a rich person. <laughs> so in the same way I hang around dying people, I hang around rich people. They're suffering too. And it's extraordinary to keep working to get through my own projective mind. So what I'm seeing as I'm talking to you is the way in which the whole process <clears throat> of coming from 61 to 94 is a process of slowly loosening the hold of awareness the way it clings, either through aversion or attraction to stuff, till my awareness is just present. And it's not like I just rest in awareness and I'm not in form. The dance is nowhere to stand. You are in form and you're not in form simultaneously. First, it's sequential. You get high, you come down. You get high, you come down. Till pretty soon, high and down are all here. And I go in and out of this. I get trapped, but I've got all these devices like the beads to keep me constantly, hey, where are you standing now? What are you doing standing there?
and I take the psychedelics, and generally they teach me something. I've noticed they're teaching me <clears throat> that they seem less and less relevant to me in terms of my own inner work. They're still profound. They are still beautiful. Some of them, some of them are horrible. I get caught. But mostly, and that's useful, although hard in my body. But I'm noticing that the whole process of taking a psychedelic is less and less of the significant thing that's going to happen to me this year. It's a checking in to see if I got anything more to learn. And I always do, but I begin to see that what I'm doing is what I got to be doing anyway. And what's the rush? I think I was caught in the myth that we got into in the 60s that we were all going to be enlightened almost immediately. We all awakened, but we didn't get enlightened. So I've said before many times, Tim Leary and I had this graph on the wall of how soon everybody would get enlightened. <laughs> it involved putting LSD in the water system, but other than that, it was not a major, <laughs> major involvement. It was just obvious. <clears throat> And I'll tell you, I, I mean, I know this is um, this is weird stuff, but today I can say anything, I guess, considering where we are. Chapman College, it's free for all. Uh, <laughs> honors to Chapman, I must say. Um, I think that what happened in the 60s with psychedelics, when it became... Um, a street consciousness issue. Um, I think that was like a um, an incredible uh, psychic explosion. And that you and I and the culture is still, we are all still growing into the fallout from that. That what seems to me happened, at least for me and for the people around me at that time, was that we began to see the relative nature of reality. We saw that our storylines, who we thought we were, who our parents thought they were, what we thought we were doing, where we thought we were going, how old we thought we were, all of it was just one plane of reality. It was all overdetermined that we would learn this. I mean, uh, science was showing us that physics and genetics. Communication and transportation were changing our concepts of time, made time be much more liquid and flexible. And I think, the, and then the, the uh, minstrels, the rock and roll movement, carried that message of more than one plane of consciousness out into the back regions of the world. I mean, at the height of, of the Soviet Union, American rock songs were a healthy part of the underground. And what I find now is that I can speak in a place I don't say a place because they all get upset when I say that they're at that place, but I can speak in a place like X, where I look out at the audience and I would say that 75 or 80 percent of them have never smoked grass, have never had any psychedelic other than, I, no, they haven't. They've had liquor, alcohol, and cigarettes, and coffee, and sleeping pills. Uh, diet pills, Prozac, but, but no psychedelics. I mean, it's just bizarre, you know, and, uh, and I'll say something that in the sixties, when I said it to my 15, 20 year old the audiences who were 15 to 25, who all wore white and smiled a lot, I'd say the farthest out thing I'd know. And they'd all go, yeah, yeah. And now I would say that same thing 
since I haven't changed my material in 20 or 30 years, say the same thing in X city. And these people, I mean, these people that just don't get high, they, you just know you wouldn't go up to them and ask them for a joint. They're all going like that. And I think, how do they know what happened? What possibly happened? My most delicious story about that, I'll just throw it up because I'm sure many of you heard it, was that back in the old days, everybody was very young and that came in my audiences. Now uh, it's, it's much more of a spread of ages. But then it was all a narrow range. It was interesting. I go to India and I'd hang out with all the old people because they all spoke the same language, come to the West and speak to all young people. And there was one woman in the front row who was about 70. And everybody else was 25 at the most. And everything I'd say, she'd nod. And I couldn't stand it. I mean, I'm sitting up there wondering, who is she? How does she know? She doesn't look like an acid head. What is this? What is this all about? <laughs> and finally... At the end of the lecture, I kind of looked at her and smiled and like willed her over to me. She came up and she said, oh, thank you. That's just the way I thought it was. And I said, how do you know? What is it you do that brings you into the state of consciousness where you know this? And she leaned forward very conspiratorially and she said, I crochet. But when I look at the audiences now and I see how much mainstream stuff that I do is received, I would say that what happened in the 60s really happened. And that the inertia of the habits of thought we have, I mean, the inertia is reflected in the incredible way in which people are identifying with ethnic groups or religious groups or sexual groups or anything holding tight to their identity and killing to defend their identity. Those are old models. There are other models which celebrate diversity without getting trapped in it, in which your a consciousness is not busy. I'm not busy being a Jew or a man or an American or old, or a psychedelicist, or a yogi, or any of it. Those are all labels. They're all like this jacket. There's stuff you put on and you take off. When I meet you, you're another being just like me. What's your trip? Who do you think you are today? We got to meet through form, but we don't have to get trapped in it. It's like I drive an MG. What do you drive? I'm an MG driver. Yeah. But dear, we're in bed. No, I'm an MG driver. You know, it's like... Now, I know that it's not um, politic yet to imply that psychedelics have turned out to play a critical role in this culture. But I basically think they have. I think they were a pseudopod starting back in the 40s and 50s through the beat period into the 60s. I think that that way, and it's, it's really interesting. I'm here in L.A. Um, giving a lecture this weekend um, on Aldous Huxley for his 100th birthday anniversary. And when Aldous wrote his book, Island, which I'm sure many of you have read, um, he presented a model of how a conscious community could be. And the, the education was ecologically based and it was much more, I mean, he wrote this in, you know, in 60. And uh, now he's, he's so timely now. And then at around 15 years old, the first 15 years you had to become somebody, you went into somebody training. 
And then around 15, you went through a ritual, an initiation in the culture in which you went through, you climbed the side of a mountain, came down the side of a mountain with other people with a lot of help, but it was a very scary initiation, a physical feat of strength and determination and all. And then you went from there into this um, meditative open temple and you were given the moksha medicine. And the medicine put your whole somebodyness into perspective. It was something that in, reminded you of the formless root or the formlessness that is imminent within form. As the uh, Tibetan uh, Heart Sutra says, form is no other uh, than emptiness, emptiness no other than form. And this was seen as a ritual. I mean, I took psilocybin when I was 30 years old. And I realized how encrusted my entrapment in my identity had gotten. And that's why how violent was the necessity for me to break out of it that way. I'm going to... Um, Israel in a few weeks and meeting with people that help the Arabs and Israelis hear each other, listen to each other. And I just could imagine if they could all have a trip together. If that was part of an institutional game of, of political mediation. I mean, we're sneaking psilocybin, psychedelics back into our society through research like the MDMA research that's going on, through research, through the use of uh, marijuana for people with pain, uh, through uh, dying, research with the dying. And ultimately, we'll do the same side of stuff we, uh, about alcoholism, about prison rehabilitation, so on. I mean, it's obvious that psychedelics properly used have a behavior change psychotherapeutic value. But from my point of view, that is all it is all underusing the vehicle. The potential of the vehicle is sacramentally to take you out of the cultural constructs which you are part of a conspiracy in maintaining and giving you a chance to experience once again your intimate your your innocence and And you can feel because um, of who has control of the social institutions of religion and what's happened to the Native Americans up in the Northwest and so on, how difficult it is for a society that is frightened as ours is. And when it's frightened, it holds tightly to its institutions and its structure because it's frightened of chaos. And you say, I want to take the people of your society through an experience that will take them out of organized conceptual mind back into innocence. And that is seen as a basic threat to the existing social institution. And it's bizarre because if you look at the downfall of civilizations, you will see that it's just that panic and control and closing and constricting that is what keeps destroying civilizations. This is a very subtle and profound issue. Because there isn't, and I'm going to stop now, I'm sorry I've gone so long. There isn't, there isn't any problem, whether it's population, um, environmental issues, justice issues, resource distribution and equity. There isn't one of those social problems 
that can't be dealt with more profoundly through the kind of wisdom that comes through inner work. And psychedelics is clearly, if used with the right set in a supportive setting, is a brilliant way to start that inner work. And yet you and I may be witness to a time when we have something that would work and we are in a culture that rejects that possibility so thoroughly that it ends up destroying itself. Isn't that interesting? And the only place you can stand in relation to that, the two places, is one in the place of such spaciousness you just look and say how poignant that all is and see the way it all unfolds lawfully. And the other part where you're in your human heart, where it hurts like hell, and you do whatever you can to change it. And I'm inviting you to join me in cultivating those two planes of consciousness. From the human heart point of view, suffering stinks. From the pure consciousness point of view, suffering is. Suffering is like trees have leaves. Suffering is, it's all part of the process of being in form. If you are so freaked by suffering, you've got to avert your eyes. You are not free. A few months ago, I took uh, um, a sacrament that I think the, um, in the liturgy it's referred to as totslan. And um, in this particular experience, it's a nine-minute um, a nine-minute uh, moment, <laughs> and um, in this particular uh, time, I took it. I've taken it several times. I turned into a a very large black woman and I was surrounded by beings who were children all suffering hungry frightened sick and I found myself opening my arms to draw them all into myself at the same moment I was Paul gave a vivid description I wasn't throwing up, but I was gagging on it all. I was, and at the same moment, I was in absolute ecstasy. I thought about those levels. The ecstasy of just being part of the total dance of life, not looking away from anything. The compassion that wants to take it all into yourself, because you are all of it. And the ecstasy of just seeing the way formless comes into form, the dance of Shiva, the beautiful dance of the Nataraj. I honor you so much for your interest that brings you here today. I feel part of a very good extended family. Thank you very much.